Thank you so much. At this point, I would like uh, to do a roll call to make sure that we have quorum. Um, it is uh, Tuesday. I'm sorry. It is sorry, guys. It is Wednesday, November seventeenth, twenty twenty one, at nine a.m. Rebecca, can you do a roll call? Good morning. Absolutely. Dr. Dara Thompson. Present. Dr. Greta D'Amico. Present. Dr. Vera Singleton. Present. Thank you. Dr. Bruce Davidson. Dr. Davidson, are you back with us? Okay, I will come back to him. Dr. Mina Yoon. Present. Thank you. And Ms. Shirley Worrells. Present. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Hi, it's Bruce. Uh, I'm back to my chair here. So Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. I have you on on the list. Thank you so much. Great. Excellent. And so we have a, we do have a quorum. Yeah, we have established quorum. And at this point, I would like to start our meeting. Um, the first uh, item that we're going to cover is public comments not on the agenda moderator. Thank you. So we have opened up the Q&A feature of WebEx for public comment and we're sharing instructions on the screen. If you'd like to make a public comment on items that are not on the current agenda, please click on the question mark Q&A icon, typically in the lower right corner of your WebEx screen. Or if you're on a mobile device, you can click the three dot other options icon to find the Q&A button. Simply type the word comment into the text box and hit send, and comments will be taken in the order received, and each commenter will have three minutes to speak. We'll give people just a moment to locate that feature. And I see no request for public comment at this time. Shall I close the Q&A? Please do. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is a review and possible approval of the committee meetings from October 5th. Um, Rebecca, do we do we have those in our meeting materials? I have to admit I did not Hi, see that. No, we do not. We we don't have these available at this meeting and they will be available at the 12 2 meeting for um, review and approval. Great. So we'll just um, move past that agenda item and on to the main agenda item for our meeting today, which was review and possible approval of the oversight sunset review report. I just want to let everyone know our goal for this meeting is to discuss this report. Um, in detail as much as we possibly can in today's meeting, addressing any issues that people have um, regarding it, making any edits that we're able to. We do understand that the majority of the uh, members of the committee may not have been able to read it in entirety as it is very long um, and we got it quite recently. And so our goal is to get as much done in this meeting to give you the time between this meeting and the December 2nd meeting um, to read it in even more detail um, in hopes that we can uh, get everything finalized and approved efficiently in the December 2nd meeting. So um, at this time, Rebecca, do you wanna give any sort of introduction to this before we just ask people for comments and questions um, regarding the text that they received? Rebecca, you still on? Bina, I don't see her, but maybe Ann knows that. Oh, well, I see her, but I don't see her unmuting. Can you hear me? I can hear you, and I sent Rebecca a request to unmute. Thank you. There um, we go. Do, I, do, 
Oh, Go I ahead. was just sorry. <laughs> sorry, Rebecca. I was just going to suggest going by section to see if anybody had questions by each section or comments or corrections. And as a reminder today, we can, uh, the board to cut down on the work for um, later can also approve um, each section that's completed today, including delegating to the executive officer the authority to make any non-substantive technical cleanup changes. Thank you, Savina. That's so helpful. Um, so I think going by sections is an excellent idea. Um, Rebecca, do you have anything that you want to say before we start on that? Hi, can you guys hear me okay? We can now. Not hearing you if you're speaking currently though. It does seem like we're having some difficulty hearing Rebecca. So given that I would like to move forward. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, I, we can, I can hear you now. Did you, uh, switch okay. your audio? Yes. something's going on with my computer. So I, I had to disconnect my, my headset. So if you guys get feedback, please just stop me and let me know. I'll, I'll try to, um, speak as clearly as possible and hope that my computer's picking me up. Okay. Great. So what Sabina had recommended is that we go section by section and that any sections that we're able to approve um, as long as there's no substantive changes that we can approve those by section today so that we have less to do in our follow up meeting, which seems like an excellent idea. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I had asked the question, but you had some audio issues just if there was any um, introductory information you want us to have before we start section by section questions and comments. Sure. So last night um, I had received some just a grammatical error changes um, and edits from uh, Dr. D'Amico. So I have made those and it was just, you know, commas and a couple of things that we, we missed in in um, in the writing portion. So I made those. Um, she does have a couple of others. We only made it about halfway through last night. So um, she has some others that she'll be sharing today um, also. So we'll pick those up. And I know that um, Dr. Mina Yoon also had some questions um, about some of these items that were in here. Um, one of them being um, if the advisory or council was only supposed to be made up of MDs. And that is not the case. But however, back in 2004 and 2005, when the advisory council was meeting, it was just MDs. So. Um, just for historical value, we did place that they were MDs, medical doctors at the time. So I just wanted to clarify that before proceeding. Thank right, you, Rebecca. So no problem. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. So it's going to change the way that I see this. So if anybody has a hand raised or anything, um, moderator, would you please be able to let me know about that when it happens? Because I won't be able to see it anymore. So. I am going to share my screen now. All right. All right. Can everybody see the 10-1-2021 naturopathic medicine background information report? Yes, we can see it, Rebecca. Okay, so, perfect. Um, so the first section is a uh, background and description of the board and the regulated profession. And this really hasn't changed because it's just historical information. There wasn't really anything to add to this. Um, so we just went in here and kind of um, placed some information. Um, I, there was just some little commas and stuff that needed to be taken care of. Um, Dr. Davidson, do you have your hand up? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you very much. So I do, I, I will have things that I want to contribute as we go through it. I did want to say that in this and there was one sentence that looked a little odd to me that I want to bring to your attention on page four. Uh, let's see. Let me look at where I've got it noted myself here. Uh, page with page four under the under the title of Bureau of Naturopathic Medicine becomes the Naturopathic Medicine Committee. 
in the second paragraph, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh line, why does it say that uh, sixth and seventh line, the Bureau was administered by three different hearing aid dispensers bureau chiefs? Is hearing aid dispensers meant not to be there? No, that is actually correct. At the time, we were part of a quad bureau. Um, so there were four programs under one bureau, and it was at that time led by the chief um, that was part of the Hearing Aid Dispensers Bureau. Oh, okay, great. I was wondering about that, whether that was meant to be there or not. Okay, that, that was it uh, there. I don't have another comment until page 17, so I'll hold off. Okay, no problem. Um, Dr. Yoon, I can see your hand now. Yes, uh, Rebecca, can you uh, just take one moment and give us just like an overview of the sunset report and this process of um, going through um, the different, uh, it, it, is this report itself the bill that gets passed through all the different houses? So basically this report, what it is, is this is just a, a basic uh, information gathering report. So the legislature is just kind of gives us a list of questions of which we respond to. Um, when we send this over to them on January 5th, um, what they're going to do is they're going to take a look at this. They are going to provide additional questions to us at that time. We would need to take those questions and answer them. And these may be related to past issues that we may have had, new issues that have come up that we have made, uh, have, have brought up in this report, um, or new issues that the legislature feels that we need to be bringing up in this report. So um, this is just a, a basic um, fact finding um, and informational report that the legislature requires once every four years for the sunset review process. And then it actually becomes a bill at some point though, correct? It does. So after we have this, we will be getting what's called a background paper. The background paper will be asking us a series of questions relating to any issues that the legislature uh, feels are um, maybe challenges or that we're having issues as a, um, a regulatory entity. Um, and at that time, we'll provide information back to them um, and then at that point, we'll be working back and forth with the, um, the joint committees um, in terms of coming up with the bill language. Um, and then at that point, it will become a bill that goes through the, the process as any other bill would. Okay, so no, none of the language uh, currently in this uh, sunset uh, re report will be um, necessarily like in a bill. Oh, no, no, not okay. at all. And even okay. some of the stuff that we want to be in a bill probably won't make it into a bill. So it's just, it's, it's very dependent on the process and the kind of the facts that they find at this point and the information that we provide to them. Um, and then maybe information that they may know of um, that's kind of a trend here in California that they may bring up to us. So perfect. Thank you so time. much. No problem. And Dr. D'Amico. Yes, I found something uh, a few minutes ago <laughs> on page two. If we're if we're ready to kind of go section by section, um, which is under naturopathic medicine today, um, we're the thirteenth state. This says currently seventeen states, but it's actually twenty five. It's twenty two states currently. It is um, and. I Okay, good. When we looked that up. It's 22 states plus three territories and, you know, districts and so forth. So thank you for catching that. Yeah. Um, and just as a reminder, we do have a hard stop at today's meeting at 1225. Um, we have a couple of doctors. We'll get through. As and Rebecca, then you're fading we'll out. I'm We're sorry, can you hear me okay? Okay, I'll, I'll slow down. Maybe the computer's not picking me up correctly. So um, we have a hard stop at 1225. So I just wanted to let you know that we will be getting through as much of this as we can today. Um, and then we will be reconvening on 12-2 to 
finalize the review and approval process of this report. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, are there any more um, changes that need to be made to this section one, the history? This is Dr. D'Amico. Um, did you, let's see, page three in the middle before early history? Good, never mind. So all of the changes, Dr. D'Amico, that you sent over to me last night, I have made in here. Um, and so the only thing that is not on here are some of the and unfortunately, I don't know, but when you sent it over, it changed where those questions that you had were. So they were kind of in weird places that they probably shouldn't have been. So, and I think it was just the from going from your computer to mine. So I, I apologize that I did not put the questions on here because I just did not know where they belonged. So if okay. you have those comments or so questions, have, please feel free I'll just to kind ask. of go through the things that aren't grammatical here. On Perfect. page um, eight, where we're describing the education, it says second year, go back up to first year, second year. Uh huh. Um, it says students must pass all basic science courses and diagnosis courses, as well as a clinic entrance exam. But then we say students must pass a clinical primary status exam to proceed into clinic under third year. And that's a little confusing because I think it's just one. Yes, it, it is just one. It's at the end of the second year where they take the- Okay, so uh, you got rid of it in the third year, I got, got it. it. Third year. Okay. We have here in, there's sections here in program enrollment. Rebecca, and, you're still fading in and out of it. Okay. Can you hear me a little bit better now? I can hear you right now, but your response to Greta, I could only hear about half of it. I'm going to slow down. I think that the computer is not able to pick me up. If I continue, if you guys continue to have this issue, um, let me know and I will do a phone call in instead. So here you'll you'll notice that Boucher and CNMC um, don't have the information in here, and it's because they did not contact us back. So um, we left that uh, blank, and we added this here to advise that they did not provide the data. All right. Rebecca, this so is uh, right. Dr. Thompson. I have a more general question about this section. Sure. Um, so are, are you saying, it, when I read over it, I just thought, wow, this is a very long response. Um, and is this fairly consistent with what we put through in our last, you know, three sunset reviews? Is that what you're saying? It is, correct. Okay. So just making sure this is something that, you know, this level of detail has been seen and appreciated previously. It has been. And and the reason that it was put in the, um, I mean, the, there's a lot of people that just don't know anything about naturopathic medicine or who a naturopathic doctor is, what they do. So this really gives that full um, historical information for any legislature or legislator who may not know about NDs or about naturopathic medicine. And this really will just kind of highlight all of the challenges that we've had along the way. So um, yeah, we, we decided to keep this in here as long as you guys are okay with it. So, Dr. yes, go ahead. If you're ready to keep going, did you wanna say something first? Absolutely, I'm ready to keep going. And it looks like we have um, somebody with their hand raised. Unfortunately, I think it's Dr. Singleton. Hi, 
Hi, yes, it's me. This is Dr. Singleton. So I have a quick uh, just clarification. This is on page five. Um, this is under the paragraph, the practice of naturopathic medicine, first, second, third paragraph. There's description about um, uh, many MDs are also licensed acupuncturists and several are licensed midwives. And then we get into uh, like specific numbers of who's a registered nurse to our PAs, et cetera. Is that something that needs to be updated or should we take it out because it's not relevant? Or, or sorry, it's more, it's probably a lot more numerous since we've had a lot more MDs become, or, or students become MDs who probably have prior medical experience. What are your thoughts probably, on that? Um, what, we, what I could do is just kind of update this information here to state that there's more than this, but these are the ones that we are definitely aware of. Um, so I will add here. Because I think it's important, especially if this was, if this kind of statistic was submitted before, um, if we're going to keep it in that we show growth or we get general about uh, the fact that uh, NDs, people who have ND uh, licenses or, or um, uh, degree holding licenses uh, are also uh, uh, licensees of other health professions. So either or. Yeah, so we'll go ahead mm -hmm. and we will um, add some growth information here. Okay, thank you. Okay, Dr. D'Amico, did you um, want to continue? Yeah, my question's on the bottom of page 13, last paragraph. It says, most health insurance providers do not cover or reimburse, it's last paragraph on my document, not on yours, do not cover or reimburse naturopathic care, even with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, which specifies that all licensed primary care providers must be covered by insurance. This causes a California consumer who chooses an ND as their primary care provider to double up on doctor visits to comply with Medi-Cal laws. Can you tell me, can you um, explain this Medi-Cal thing? Because this would be necessary. Yeah, what does that mean? So Medi-Cal um, covers naturopathic office visit, but not well, I'm sorry, let me take that back. It does not cover the office visit itself. It covers any labs or anything that a naturopathic doctor would um, would order, but not the actual visit to the naturopathic doctor itself. So it's right. yeah, it's, it covers it's labs and prescriptions. So we might want to just explain that um, with which specify that naturopathic like you know, which medical laws which specify that uh, tests and prescriptions ordered by naturopathic doctors will be covered, but not their office visits. We can just add that to the sentence and then it'll be clear because not everyone who reads this is going to know that. Okay, um, and then what I did also was, let's see, I um, added this. So this wasn't here yesterday. Um, you guys had, however, it does, um, I added that this these provisions took a, but the qualifying regulations were not effective. Which you are going in and out again. Okay, let me let me slow down. So these provisions took effect in 2018, but the qualifying regulations were not effective in California law until January 1st, 2016 in the California uh, Health and Safety Code and the Insurance Code, and I added the sections there. When these regulations were created, a few insurance providers started to cover naturopathic treatments, providing the treatments had the same ICD-9 and CPT code uh, billing codes that other PCPs were using. So um, I just added this for clarification.
I wonder oh, if we might want to check with all the committee members to see how far they got in terms of looking over this, because we'll want to slow down at the point where we didn't all have a chance to read. Okay, perfect. So was everybody able to get through the first um, couple of sections, at least, of this report? Uh, Dr. Singleton? I was able to get to um, the round page 15. We will just slowly move along here. Uh, this is Dr. Thompson and I actually skimmed the whole document, but would like to read the entire thing in more detail before approving it. Absolutely. I totally agree. This is Bruce. I was able to get through pretty much the whole document um, until the wee hours. Uh, so I do have comments throughout. Right. I will go ahead and then we will just start going through this then. So I am currently, we're in the first section of this report. Um, and what we'll do is we'll just move along. If anybody has any um, comments or anything that they'd like to add, like Bruce, you said you had several, um, and I know Dr. D'Amico has some near the end, um, the, the second half of this report. So let's go ahead and start, start taking those now. So does anybody have any comments or edits that they would like to see in the first section? I'm sorry, this is Dr. Thompson, and I sincerely apologize. I cannot find the raised hand button on my on my screen here. Next everywhere. to your name. It's next to your name on participants. You have to roll over your name for it to show up. Okay. Uh, yeah, still not working for me. Although it looks like someone raised my hand for me, which is nice. Um, okay. So um, I just wanted to say regarding the section we were just talking about, I think it is implied, but not spelled out specifically how much of an economic disparity there is in people who can access naturopathic medical care. Um, so what, you know, these insurance laws basically do is that they make it so that only people with resources can access naturopathic care which I'm sure is very upsetting to the majority of naturopathic doctors who want to you know, treat the general population. So I think adding something, something just brief stating that clearly could be helpful in that section. Dr. Thompson, this is Dr. D'Amico. Were you saying that you want us to actually read through from the beginning word for word or that you want the chance to be able to do that yourself before we approve it that i personally would want the chance i want us to go through today my preference would be for us to go through today take everyone's comments get as much reviewed as possible but then after that i would like more time to read through the document in detail prior to being comfortable approving it got it thanks so maybe Rebecca, could you maybe just ask for each page? Does anybody have anything on this page? And that way we'll all be on the same page together. Sounds good. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the first page uh, on page number one. Does anybody have any comments or edits? Dr. Yoon? I raised my hand for another page. So we'll get okay. to that. Um, and the numbers, so I actually printed it out last night, um, but the numbers are not in order toward the toward the end. Um, just wanted to point that out as well. Sure, and we'll we'll take care of all of the formatting issues and numbers and stuff like that will be done um, prior to it being submitted to the PDE unit. Um, and then of course they will also kind of take a look when they're doing their um, production and, and editing. Um, that that everything is kind of where it's supposed to be. So we will definitely take a look at that. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. And then uh, the other question is, you had mentioned like the first section. Is there um, is that the first seventeen pages that you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So uh, I don't see anybody. Um, Dr. Singleton, did you still have your hand raised, or is this a different question?
Okay, perfect. Okay, so I don't see any changes to page one. How about page two? Page. About page four or five. Six or seven. Page eight or page nine. Page 10 or 11. Dr. Yoon. So the category of issues relating to the practice of naturopathic medicine in California. Oh, nope. Scroll the other way. Oh, I'm sorry. That was page 12. Can we move on to page 12? Yes, we're on page 12. Okay. Um, so I was going through each of the issues and uh, basically I think that it could be categorized a little bit uh, better so that it's more clear. Um, so you know, the first two are about scope, there's title, there's hiring nurses, there's scope, education, um, and then overseeing doctors kind of as, as main categories. Um, because I felt like I was, when I was reading all of this, I was jumping around and, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what's in what category. And then one category that seems to be missing from this uh, category is, um, or this section, is minor surgery. We will add the minor. Um, and then was there any way that you guys would like to see? I just placed them how they were sent over. To if we um, want to for these, we can definitely do that. Just like Rebecca, I think you have to slow down. You're going in and out. Okay. So let me know if you would like to reorder these um, bullet points and we can definitely do that. Right. Yeah, I think Dr. that would be great. Okay, perfect. Dr. D'Amico? Yes, um, on page 12 at the top, um, it it is listing the what the doctor cannot do by the act and it says perform any surgical procedure but wasn't there a provision for minor surgery you know pending this or that report there is um pending the report that however the report that was um generated we can't hear you i'm sorry it's okay so the report that was provided to the legislature in 2007 should have provided that um, minor um, again in 2015 they submitted another um, a report to the legislature and at that point it still didn't become um, effective so at this point there is still no surgical procedures allowed um, in in statute so my understanding was that suturing was specifically not allowed, but that say removal of a skin tag that didn't require suture is allowed. That is correct. So that is a surgical procedure technically, even though there's no suturing involved. If it's technically, <laughs> this is just how the statute reads. Um, and this is just taken right out of the statute. So. 
Um, I couldn't change the wording in here, um, but if you would like to speak on it within the report, we can definitely do that. I'm not, we'll keep our eyes open for an area that discusses minor surgery. I'm not sure I saw it yet, or if I did, I don't remember. We can definitely add the minor office procedures as being an issue. And I might suggest if, if it isn't too much trouble that you call in because your mic is just in and out all the time. So we might not hear something that you're saying. Um, okay. And that way. Thanks. Let me see if I can um, do that really quick. Give me one moment. Okay, sorry, give me one more second. For some reason, it's not taking, it's asking for a code that I don't have. This is the moderator. Uh, if you go up to the audio and video menu, and you say switch audio, it will give you an option to, or some information to call in. That gives you your access and your ID number. I, mm, let me see here. Um, it's, I'm, I don't see the whole, whole WebEx right now um, because I'm on this. Oh, because you're presenting. Presenting, yeah. So okay. I can't see all you're of that stuff. You're welcome to stop presenting for a moment. Okay, that's gonna that's gonna be good. Okay, that'll work. And then so, you should see switch audio call in, and then it'll you'll be able to see first is the phone number to call, and second is enter your access code and your attendee ID, and that will link your phone call to your computer screen so that you're still just one person. So don't use the call me at option. I've I've not played with that much. I usually call in. I'm more comfortable with that. Okay, so can you guys hear me okay now? Yes, that's better. Okay, perfect. All right. Let me just turn my phone up a little so I can hear. All right, <laughs> and I will start sharing my screen again. Perfect. All right. All right, you're okay. all set, ready to continue. Perfect, we can move right along. Okay, so were there any other questions on this? Uh, Dr. Yoon, I see your hand raised. Sorry, I just kept it up. No worries, Dr. Thompson. Uh, I've had a similar concern um, regarding the wording here on uh, traditional Chinese and Asian medicine. Um, and the inclusion of Chinese herbal medicine as being um, 
uh, restricted. I think we need yes. to have some sort of a um, uh, some sort of a, an explanation or further um, explanation of that uh, because, of course, naturopathic doctors use herbs that are included in the Chinese pharmacopoeia all the time. We're not practicing traditional Chinese herbal medicine, which is a specific type of herbalism and blending, you know, that it's not part of our scope, but we use herbs that are, um, you know, of Chinese origin and of Chinese herbal origin, as well as Ayurvedic and traditional American and traditional European, et cetera, in our botanical formula. So just want to make sure that we don't somehow say that we can't use astragalus, for example. Right. So again, this is um, section 3642, and this is how it's outlined in our statute. Um, but we will definitely um, speak to the fact that this is anything that is outside of a naturopathic doctor's scope, and that may be within the scope of an LAC, because that's basically what this is telling us that we can't do these items or these things unless they also hold an LAC license, so which is an acupuncture license. So um, we can definitely add some information here that provides explanation that this is not um, within the LAC scope, but that Chinese herbs um, are used um, within naturopathic treatment or medicine. Yeah, I think we could easily put something clear, some sort of brief clarifying statement saying that um, naturopathic doctors, you know, are trained in botanical medicine from around the world and may use herbs um, from a vi variety of locations. This, you know, but this is not considered traditional Chinese herbalism. Correct. Correct. Something okay, perfect. That, that effect. Yes, that'll work. All right, and Dr. D'Amico. I was just going to say, perhaps we could either add asterisks or put a note, just a, like a italicized note at, after this list, since we can't change what the statute says, um, saying surgical minor office procedures, surgical procedures, you know, were being considered pending, blah, 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 you know, C section X of this report for more information. And uh, my understanding on the Chinese part was it was really about using the traditional Chinese medicine system of diagnosis and treatment. It, it, it didn't have anything to do with specific herbs. Um, so we could write it that way. Okay. So we could say, you know, this refers to the, the TCM, you know, method of diagnosis and treatment, not, not the use of specific substances ever. Perfect. Yeah, I like that wording, Greta. Okay, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, were there any other questions, Dr. Thompson? Not at this time, thanks. Okay, perfect. All right, so moving right along, uh, that was page 12, we'll go to page 13 and 14. Okay, I don't see any issues with these two pages. Hi, this is Dr. Singleton. Um, so I think we said this already, just in terms of um, having this be a little bit more clear with sections of Scope and then the paragraphs that are uh, related to scope issues, and mm -hmm. then we decided to add in uh, the minor surgery. Um, yeah. I'm I'm always a fan, and I think um, everyone wants to know about the the end goal impact. Um, so if there's any way that we could have actual numbers or statistical differences or changes, I think that might be um, more effective. So that's, so that's comment number one. If we have any statistics around increases or decreases or impact around uh, what having limited scope uh, 
does to either changes in uh, uh, licensures granted or um, or anything similar. Um, and then the second thing is around um, maybe more pronounced, and I don't want to be really, you know, to practice hyperbole, but uh, I think that having a bottom line impact, like this is the impact of us not having, you know, X, Y, and Z, so that it's very clear um, in paragraph, in paragraph. Because ultimately, it's a very long document, and people are going to read it. But I think if there's, you know, like a header or a section, or even broken up into the par a separate paragraph that says, you know, this is the impact of why, and it's straightforward and it's very clear. Okay, Dr. Singleton, this is Dr. D'Amico. Um, there are sections around page sixty that talk about the impact all of this has on licensees, consumers, and workforce development. Um, so it's extremely detailed there. So I'd say let's let's look at that. And then, but it might, it, it is a good question to say, should some of this be loaded toward the front? How detailed are people when they read through these things? Yeah, that's, that's a good, good, um, suggestion and um, there are a lot of the issues of the end impact information that I think Dr. Singleton is wanting to see in the end kind of under the issues um, and again this is just the historical information in this first part of the section um, and we really start going into what it's doing um, and how it's impacting the committee and how it's impacting the licensees and um, of course, how it uh, affects the consumer at the end. So um, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll, what we'll do, I think the, the best thing is to kind of work through this. Um, I'm gonna take all of these this, you know, suggestions that you guys are providing down. And then once we're at the end of this, um, we'll take a look at kind of what we're missing in the front. If you wanna kind of load it in the front more than in the back, we can definitely do that. Um, however, it does need to be placed in the back because that's where they're looking at those issues and how we're wanting to resolve them. So for it to be in the front and then never, you know, stated again would kind of be falling on deaf ears because really they're looking at those back statements. Um, as we go through this report, you'll kind of see what I'm, I'm talking about. But mm -hmm. um, I think Dr. Greta uh, D'Amico brought up a great point. Mm -hmm. Well, I, more is better, <laughs> and, these are, <laughs> it and, is. These are the, and these are the issues that we're going to take to try to get a bill supported, too. So, yeah. you know, even if we say it twice, I think it has more impact, and people have read fatigue, so, you know, maybe by page 30 or 40, they're done, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, um, but if we say it twice, there's no harm in it. Sure, absolutely. So I think what we need to do for this, um, this section here with the issues relating to the practice of naturopathic medicine is um, first to kind of go through these and see how we want to reorder them. Um, and then at that point, um, we'll do the reordering. We can put some of the end impacts on these and some of them actually have them in there. Um, if you're actually wanting stats and stuff added to it, I'm gonna have to go and pull those from the the rest of the report and bring them back up into this. Um, I think we do have some of the stats in here that you're kind of looking for in terms of increases and decreases to the information. Okay, and my apologies, I haven't made it to that page yet. So. No, you're fine, you're, you're absolutely fine. These are all great suggestions and recommendations. Thank you. Okay. Can we simply so, refer to the sections? So, as noted in such and such on page blog, so that we don't have to rewrite it, but we can just refer to that section um, so that someone can quickly skim there and look at it? Yes, we can. Please refer to section X for more detail. Right, and we, we have that in a couple of places in this report as well. So yeah, we can definitely do that. That's, that's perfect. All right. 
So let's go ahead and continue on. Um, what we can do is if you guys don't mind, um, and I think um, Mina, um, when you ask to reorder these, is there an order preference that you're wanting to see, or is this something that maybe you want to do a reorder and send it over to me and we can just kind of reorder it that way? Sure, I can give uh, the first stab at it. Okay, perfect. Oh, I'm just writing down as we go, sorry. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll move on uh, page 14 and 15. Were there any changes or comments for page 14 and 15? Okay, seeing none, I will go ahead and continue. Uh, we've got page 16 and page 17. So I just want to bring to your attention that on page 16 under the formulary subcommittee, I did add these gray areas here. Um, basically just kind of giving, providing some more information. Um, Dr. D'Amico had asked um, in her comments that, you know, we are not telling them that you know, we, we provided these reports and nothing happened. So this is kind of letting them know that, hey, we've provided these reports and nothing happened. So um, this is just kind of identifying that. And then on the bottom of this section here, um, she wanted to maybe reiterate that, hey, we cannot keep doing this <laughs> and for nothing to happen. So. I don't know how you really want to reward that because we also don't want to try to call out the legislature. <laughs> we don't want to do that. Um, but we do want to let them know that, you know, this is, this is taking resources. Um, we have to pay subcommittee members to do the work and we get, you know, the, um, when we have uh, people like the pharmacist, um, Dr. Koshland on, um, and you know, Dr. Virginia Osborne, that they're on subcommittees, we have to pay them as well. So you know, these things um, get expensive and for nothing to show for it, it's, it's a little frustrating. So um, we can add something here um, if you guys would like to, but I think by adding this information up here, it is kind of showing them that, hey, you know, you guys, have the, the original um, intent was to have an advisory uh, committee and to come up with the recommendations and that the legislature would take those recommendations and put them into statute for us. Well, that never happened. Um, so, and I think with them seeing that this isn't happening, it kind of seals the deal. But if you want to add something at the end, we can definitely do that. Uh, Dr. Davidson? Uh, hi, thanks. Yes. Um, so I have a couple of questions related to the um, minor office procedure subcommittee. Uh, okay. And then that leads into a couple of other questions about um, membership. Uh, membership. So uh, I was on the minor office procedure subcommittee with Dr. Spar. And mm -hmm. so my comments sort of arise from that. I guess I was it seemed to me as though part of what might be beneficial to note in this section is the fact that we, we had the committee, we were beginning to do the work, Dr. Spar had to resign, and there has been no uh, MD member uh, appointed that could be assigned to replace him, so therefore there, there could not be any further action taken in this arena. It doesn't seem to be noted here, should it be? Um, I did not note it here. However, it is noted that we have lost um, our physician um, participants and because of that, that we have not been able to carry out the business of the subcommittees because we really need those physicians to be on those um, to just kind of get the broad um, 
you know, information or the broad experience and skills in order to get those re uh, recommendations over to the full committee. Um, so that is in there, but I will add it to this information too. Yeah, the, what you were just saying, it seems to me to be kind of more of a, of a big picture statement. Yes. It's all true, of course, but this committee itself, this committee itself, I mean, I'm trying to remember when the last meeting was. I think it was in the fall of 2019, maybe. That is correct. Yeah, so it's really been on a, in a holding pattern for quite a long time and really unable to move forward on that basis. Would Maybe that would at least explain, you know, why uh, that there's no action since then. Yes, that is a good idea. I will definitely do that. Yeah, maybe only just a sentence or two. But that kind of also leads me to a series. Oh, no, I did have one other thing about wording here. Um, so I'll, do, shall I pause a moment while you're making notes, Rebecca, or shall I keep talking? Nope, you can keep talking. I've already added that note. Okay, and so then in, in the in the latter part of that of that section, in the last paragraph, the last mm -hmm. sentence of the last paragraph, it says, "This is a barrier that we would like removed." Dot 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 to assist in lessening the exodus of NDs leaving the state to pursue a fuller scope of practice. So I know. Throughout the report, there's various references to this issue, and that's clearly an important issue for the profession. But I guess I don't remember seeing elsewhere, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it in the context of this sentence, whether we actually have any numbers um, about that, because Exodus, you know, implies parting of the Red Sea and huge numbers of people, you know, um, moving forward, so to speak. And so I guess it seems to me as though it may be helpful to get a sense of, of numbers uh, somewhere along the way uh, about this issue. Um, and I don't know if we have them or not, but um, there's a, it, this is sort of a, um, uh, a statement which reflects a personal perspective on the numbers rather than actually providing numbers. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, so what I can do is I can pull the numbers from down in the licensing section where we actually have the data in those tables and we can add it here because there was, so in 2016, um, right prior to our last sunset, we had a big spike in um, people both renewing and in applications. And that was because at the time we had um, Senate Bill S, B, I believe it was SB 538 going through, which was a, um, an attempt on a scope expansion. And so I believe that there were a lot of NDs and students, um, Baxter students who were extremely hopeful at the time that that was going to be successful. And unfortunately it was not. Um, so right after that, we actually seen a drop in our renewals. We seen a drop in our applications, a tremendous drop in our applications. Um, so there, there is some trend showing there, and we can absolutely put some information in here that will actually show um, and, and uh, have that data there that um, can support this statement. All right, or as I guess was mentioned earlier, maybe just a reference to, a, to another section to, sh sure. to, to make it more um, sort of manageable from that point of view. Um, Okay, so that, I had a, so that was the question I had there. But then my question about Dr. Spar uh, resigning led me to think about the next few pages which show all these tables related to membership and attendance. And it struck me that in my tenure with the committee, we've, uh, we've, we've had several people um, leaving or, or ending their um, appointments, uh, but somehow or another, uh, their participation is invisible here. Uh, so Dr. Spar was a member and he was a member for a while and he participated as a member for a while since the last sunset report, but, but he's not mentioned, that's not mentioned anywhere here. In addition, uh, Dr. Gregory Weisswasser was involved in the committee's work and uh, before his appointment ended after its grace period. And there was a Dr. Michael Hurt, I believe, 
who was on the committee when I first joined. And I was wondering whether we really ought to be noting that there have been other people who have come and gone, but who have participated in the work since the last sunset report. Sure, I will absolutely add them back in here. So I, we only put the, um, the members that are current. Um, however, it does ask to include vacancies. So I'll add the three vacancies on here. And then what I can do is I'll just put another table on here that um, shows the members who have resigned or had termed out since the last sunset. That way they're they're in here and, and people know about them. Uh, it seems to me as though that, that would be helpful. I mean, particularly in the context that I was mentioning initially in this, in my comment now, with regard to the fact that the Minor Office Procedures Subcommittee had to stop um, doing its work because Dr. Spar left, but then Dr. Spar is like invisible in this report. So it, it, it just seems like that would be a good idea. So thank you for that. Absolutely. And then along these lines, I'm going to just j jump ahead a tiny bit to, to these tables of attendance and an appointment and note that it appears to me as though Dr. Quinn uh, was actually appointed because there's a, after these, these attendance tables, there's a roster table, was actually appointed in December of 2018, but on the table of his attendance, it says his appointment was in July of 2018. And I've already correct. I corrected that last night. I noticed it, so that's already been corrected. And then, uh, was he not part? Did he not participate in the meetings that were held in November of 2018 and March and July of 2019? His was his first committee meeting really in, in May of 2020? Uh, it seems if his appointment was in 2018, that maybe there's a few more dates that he actually participated in meetings. Yes, although he was appointed in December of 2018, his first meeting unfortunately wasn't until March of 2019 because oh. we were having a lot of difficulty getting um, in contact with him after his appointment. So yes. um, his first meeting was in March and that is on here. And we did also add the, um, the uh, commit subcommittees information in here as well. Oh, I see. Okay. So, yeah, so, so I'm sorry. Yeah, I misspoke. Uh, if he was appointed in December, he couldn't have attended the November meeting in 2018, but, but he did attend the, the March 2019 meeting and the July 2019 meeting, I guess, or at least those meetings were held in the, during his tenure, and and the draft that you sent uh, last night didn't show those dates. So that's been updated. Is that what you're saying? It has been updated. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Great. So I guess yeah, those are the things that I wanted to bring up here. Thank you very much. Perfect. No problem, Dr. D'Amico. Okay, so this is back to the uh, minor office procedure subcommittee. Um, I would like, I'd like us to be clear, and I'd like to communicate with clarity what this is all about. Because what we're told is that the original intent of the law was that minor office procedures would be included pending review of the legislature after a report from a subcommittee. Right. Um, we haven't actually said that anywhere. We have said that we did these reports, but we haven't said this intent. And I think that's part of the footnote we decided to add in when we were listing the uh, things that doctors were not allowed to do under the statutes of above, right? We're going to add that in. It is, but I do believe that somewhere in this report, it does state the intent of the original bill. That was and how do we how do we actually say this is the intent? Like, what is it about the bill that tells us this was the intent? So, in our current statute, it still states that the. Uh, let me see. I'm. I, I don't know if I have it right offhand. Let me see if I can find it really quick. Okay. One second. So 
So I believe in our application of chapter, maybe? Or was it licensure? I think it's in the licensure. Anyway, somewhere in our statute, there is a section that still states that the um, that the committee was supposed to form subcommittees to provide that information to the legislature. So I will find that for you and, and send it over to you, Dr. D'Amico. Um, but because I know the history of this and just looking at the old min minutes from the advisory council meeting, reading the, um, the recommendations that were sent to the legislature, it's all spelled out in there that the intent of the, um, the Naturopathic Doctors Act when it was originally um, created was to provide information back to the legislature after an advisory council had taken a look at the education, the training, and skills of a naturopathic doctor to determine what would be appropriate for the statute to be put in code. So, okay. um, so yeah, it, it, I, it's I there. Would, I would love to see that in the little asterisk, note, footnote, whatever that we have for minor surgery in that list of things we're not allowed to do. What you just okay. said, literally. Perfect. And then, and, and the reason that I'm asking all this is that <clears throat> Report after report, sunset review after sunset review, we keep mentioning this subcommittee and the subcommittee couldn't meet and the subcommittee recommend, provided recommendations, nothing happened, we didn't need new recommendations. And really what our ask is, is simply to approve that we can do minor office procedures. And I think I'd, I'd like us to be very clear that we have that ask because we're not asking, we don't even need them to approve the report, frankly, if they'll just, give us the minor office procedures that we're trained for. It's been verified multiple times over and over again. Okay. We yeah. will definitely put a footnote in here. And just like uh, previously, we can say, uh, like I think what Bruce was mentioning is <clears throat> refer to section X for specific numbers on the impact this may have had on workforce development or consumer access. Okay, we will and, definitely put that in there. And then one other thing that I think is important that is important to clarify for anyone reading this and for doctors as well, is that what is meant by this specifically, and I don't know where this is located originally, is unfortunately it's suturing. Um, we're actually, as far as I know, we're allowed to even biopsy so we can cut, but we can't sew together. And so right. we actually can do some minor surgery. It's not, uh, it's not a blanket term. It's, it's specifically having to do with suturing. I don't know why or where that came from, um, but it's not um, brought out in this report anywhere. And we might just wanna just put in a few words to just clarify that somewhere where it makes sense. Okay. That seems especially key, Greta, since the majority of other medical providers don't suture at this point either. They use steri strips or glue. Right. And, and so and we, as you it might even see, yeah, and you know, and I actually stated here where, you know, NDs can administer hormones um, and, you know, there's a lot of NDs that would like to use the pellets and they can't because it requires a, a, like a little sterile strip or, or a suture, um, like when we had the lady come and do the presentation from the biohormones and, um, you know, it really takes a lot of what you guys can do out of your scope and it, it is very frustrating. So yeah, we, we can definitely add that um, NDs are allowed to biopsy um, in you know certain circumstances, but cannot suture and that carries a, a big issue. So we'll definitely- and that, um, that, that sentence is a little misleading because if we have a physician that we're working with, we can use the anesthetic and we can use Sterostrips. 
So we can actually put these pellets in unless they need a stitch. Right. So here's the, here's the issue with that. The last time that we were um, in front of the legislature, there, I, I, and I want to say that it was Dr. Pan, but I can't remember if it was him or if it was the other physician that sits on um, the committees. But one of them had asked that, you know, how and how we do hormones or how we do um, these medical procedures um, because we're not allowed to do any procedure. And at, it kind of took me back because I was thinking, no, we can do some, but it's, it, I think you're right. I think it's the way that it's written in our law. It's, it's very confusing and it's, it's definitely not black and white. It's kind of murky. So I think, um, you know, if, I, and I think that's where the, the regulations come into play is, you know, the committee has a responsibility that if our statute is a little murky, that we have to clarify within regulations. So if if the section of, you know, minor office procedures in, in terms of what an ND is allowed to do with a biopsy, um, we, we need to probably further clarify that within regulations. So can we if, put a little paragraph get... in there citing the original source of the understanding slash confusion, you know, just what it says and mm -hmm. state that up to this point, the committee has interpreted it in this way that, uh, you know, they can, they can do everything except suturing, um, which definitely limits what they can do. That way it's going to take some pressure off of us during defense of the you know, when we testify in front of the legislature, we don't want this question to come up. So if the paragraph is in there, we've already told them what we would tell them. Um, we can maybe avoid some questions, make it very clear. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay. And are there any other Questions on these sections here? Uh, Dr. Thompson. Yes, just to further elaborate on that, I, I agree with what you all were saying, but I just want to say I don't want us to put the time and effort into clarifying something in regulation if it's already clear, right? So if it's clear, that suturing is what NDs cannot do, we can simply spell that out in this report such that it's clear that they are excluded from suturing, but they are allowed to apply stereo strips, glue, do biopsies, et cetera. And I think that that, that is simply clarification of what's already there um, and not, you know, not something that necessarily requires regulation. Sure. All right, and Dr. Davidson. Thanks. Uh, so yes, along these lines, um, again, uh, uh, maybe this is m more of a question because I'm not a practitioner uh, in this about this. So so uh, um, I, as a patient, I did have some minor surgery over the summer, and I was happy to discover that stereo strips and glue, you know, obviated the need for for sutures, which is like kind of wonderful from a patient's perspective. But I guess my, my question is, given the fact that there's stereo strips and glue nowadays, does that mean that many, if not most, or even all minor office procedures could al always be, be, be handled with stereo strips or glue and that sutures would like almost never be necessary? Uh, um, it is, uh, is it possible that in a discussion that may arise, you know, in, in terms of pushback, uh, that that kind of a point would be raised. It's like, well, nowadays everybody uses stereo strips and glue, so sutures are never necessary. Um, Dr. Davidson, this is Dr. D'Amico. Yeah. I can say from my own experience when I practice in Arizona <clears throat> that the scalp in particular, like if there's a laceration to the scalp, I don't think that stereo strips would hold it because there's such high tension there. Um, I again, I haven't been doing it for many years since I moved to California, but I had to do stitches in someone's scalp. You know, a kid that 
that split their scalp open on something. And I don't think sterile strips would have held that. I see. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. So I guess my, um, where I'm going with this is that, that uh, we, I guess we do want to make it clear that, that while sterile strips and glue are wonderful additions to the, to the, to the office practice, there, there are always going to be circumstances where sutures are going to be necessary. And sometimes we don't even know what those will be until we are into the procedure, I guess. So, so. That yeah. And to also clarify when you do a biopsy, which is like when you're taking something off the skin, there's two ways to do it. There's a punch biopsy, which is like a circular uh, razor in a sense that just, you can kind of twist into the skin and it'll take off the top layer. If that is bigger than about, I don't know, half an inch or so, or even a little smaller than that, that has to be usually stitched with one or two stitches. I don't know if a sterile strip would hold that because of the shape of it being round. Mm -hmm. um, when you use an actual lancet and you, there's a different way of doing it where the skin would meet more easily together and that probably could use a sterile strip. And that's, this is where we need the, you know, medical doctor who's been used to doing this the last 10 years because things have changed to say, oh yeah, that's easier or that's not. See, okay, thank you. It just gave me an idea of an, of an MD who's a dermatologist I might be able to ask to apply. So thanks for the idea. Excellent. Yeah, and I and I would agree with everything you're saying, this Dr. Thompson. Um, just that, yes, the majority of minor surgery procedures are not going to require suturing, but it is in the public interest for us to be able to suture in the few um, specific situations where it is required. Yeah, and as we go through, this is Rebecca. As we move through this report, you'll notice that in some sections there is. Um, uh, we speak to the fact that about 71% of our NDs work in either a, um, uh, gosh, I can't even remember it now, um, the, help me out, Dr. D'Amico, um, they work in rural areas and um, so they, you know, the patients that come to them usually don't have other hospitals that they could just go to. So if somebody did have a, an accident and, you know, cut themselves or got a nail in their foot or something and they needed a small suture, it's something that should be in your guys' tool bag to use and unfortunately it's not at this time. So um, it, I think we should probably speak to it a little bit more about that. but. Um, yeah, all of these Rebecca, that's, are real. This is Dr. Namiko. That 71% referred to the percent of cases related to unlicensed activity. I don't ah, think I okay. saw any percentage of people working in rural areas. Let me see. It, okay, it's in here somewhere. Maybe maybe it's a little bit different, but it, there is a portion in here that talks to the percentage of our NDs who are in um, the rural areas um, and work with uh, the, under pop the underserved population. I wonder if we should um, find someone who's willing to reword this specific um, section, one of the NDs, just because uh, I think that, that someone who, um, you know, is trained as a doctor would be be um, better able to to word to reword this and to incorporate the things we were we've been talking about. Who would like to take that? Yeah, do you think that's a good um, idea? This is Doctor. This is Doctor D'Amico. I'd be willing to help with that. Um, okay. If you draft it, Rebecca, and then we can go back and forth. And that what you were looking for is page 61 of 71. The last paragraph on my current copy is with 73% of naturopathic doctors either serving in medically underserved areas or working with medically underserved population in the state, current law creates obstacles for patients seeing NDs for their primary care needs. That's the one, 73%. <laughs> Got it. Got it. 
Great, thank you so much, Greta. I, I think this is really an important point. Um, so just to reiterate, we want to reword this section such that it clarifies what NDs currently can do so as not to sort of write ourselves into a corner restricting ourselves uh, further than our actual scope does restrict us, um, but also point out that the lack of ability to suture um, is a significant hardship to consumers such that they may not be able to get um, the care that they need. And, you know, one one other thing as you were speaking, Dr. D'Amico, is just, you know, the cosmetic concerns, right? If you can't close a lesion properly, um, the potential for scarring is significant. Right, and I'd, I'd really like to see the original language where we got this interpretation, because I'm trusting that it's true, but I, I don't know where that is or what the words say. Yeah, I'll have to dig into our archived stuff a little bit later and I'll, I'll try to send you everything that I can on that, Dr. Nico. From my understanding, and when I first came on board, it was my understanding by the past uh, executive officer that it was Apparently, the AMA or CMA pushed back on the whole minor office procedure thing, and one of the reasons was they didn't want anybody suturing on the face, anything above the neck. So why we wouldn't have gotten at least the statute for anything, you know, face down or for the neck down would, I, I don't know. But that's, that was kind of some of the information that I got when I first started but I'll find that uh, information and send it out. Yeah, and this is Dr. D'Amico, and we know that the, the political environment and the members of our government have changed so dramatically since those days. It may be a completely different context now, and that might not even right. be a concern anymore, and it probably wasn't written down. It might have been a hearsay thing, and don't push on this or whatever. So we'll just sure. take fresh stock and everything here. Right, absolutely. Okay, are there any other uh, suggestions or recommendations, comments uh, for this section here of the Minor Office Procedure Subcommittee? All right, okay, let's go ahead and move along. We're at 10.22, so we'll just keep moving. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and go past the tables here. Um, so going down to page 20, Two and 23. Uh, were there any questions or suggestions for these two pages? Uh, Dr. Davidson. Hi, thanks. Uh, so let's see, yes. Um, there was a, a little typo um, immediately under table 1B in the section that's numbered one. I think there should be a plural or subcommittees in the second line. Um, the, the second line says uh, the lack of a, of a physician member appointed to the committee has prohibited the subcommittee singular, but it should be plural. Uh, let's see. Um, at least on the draft that I'm looking at, I can't. Oh, yes. I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Greta uh, caught that and we changed that last night. So thank you so much okay. for catching that as well. And then. Um, under the legislation SB 796, I had a question about that. Um, uh, did that law actually repeal the act? It says repealed the act and extended it. So repealed the act on and extended it until. So I, yeah. I don't know the details, but it struck me as, as that it would be odd that it repealed it. So that's how that's how the um, I took this directly from the analysis, the legislative analysis. So it, it did. It actually repealed the act, um, and then it after the new SB 796 went through, then it extended it through January 1st, 2022, which was then extended again with another bill because of COVID. So that's really just a reflection of the legislative process. Yeah. I guess so. It, it, I took it word for word off of the the actual um, analysis uh, digest off of the um, leg info 
I see. Okay. Yeah. I just, it, I appreciate the explanation. Uh, thank you. I just uh, didn't understand that, I guess. So it sounded a little bit odd to my ear. Okay. Thanks. That's it there. No problem. All right. And was there anything else here? Okay. So moving down to page 23 and 24. And again, these are all just um, different bills and legislation that has affected um, either our program specifically or all of the healing arts boards or boards in general under the Department of Consumer Affairs. All right, so moving right along. Um, Dr. Davidson, did you have another question or is your hand just still up? I, I Thank you, yeah, I did uh, have another question. My hand was still okay. up and I do have another question. Um, okay, perfect. So just uh, uh, not on the table, but below it, um, there's that, uh, I guess maybe this is jumping ahead to the next section, describe any major studies. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that I guess this was just last, last two months ago, September 2021. Somehow, yes. I don't remember us talking about that. So maybe I just, you know, had a senior moment. But um, did we talk about this study before? No, so this was actually sent out. Um, we we were trying to get some information. And so we sent out um, a survey to all of our licensees and conducted just a general survey and tried to c collect some of this information so that we would have it uh, moving forward. And this is just some things that we had kind of asked about in different um, uh, committee meetings in the past. And so we finally were able to get a survey put together and sent out to our um, licensee population to take part in. And these were the results of that. Um, it, we just haven't had another full committee where I could bring this information to your guys' attention, but it was just a, a study that we did. Uh, I see, yeah. So that's uh, very interesting to, to read through it because, I mean, very interesting statistics. Um, so um, it's good to see that that was done. I guess I just didn't, we just didn't know about that. So then along, uh, Let's see, so as part of that, I guess, um, on page uh, 24, the end of that, I guess, where it says, finally, the study, con we, the study concluded, uh, I, there's a little typo there, I guess, finally, we, oh, we conclude the study, I see you corrected it on yours, okay. Yes. And, um, but here again, I guess, uh, what percentage of respondents said they planned to be licensed and practice in other states? You say, again, there's a sort of a qualitative statement, but um, there's, no, there, there's no quantitative statement here. Can we make it quantitative? Sure, I can definitely grab that information. We have the percentages of how many people um, responded and because I was also able to get the raw data in an Excel spreadsheet, I can go and manipulate that to find how many said, you know, they were leaving because of independent prescribing restrictions or how many of them said that it was because now the new Board of Pharmacy's regulations that are going to be taking place are restricting them from getting compounded, you know, medications that they would normally use in their treatment. So, um, we can definitely do that. As a matter of fact, if you're interested in that, I can send you the information um, and you can kind of look at it as well. Um, but yeah, I can absolutely add the percentages of these, um, these answers of the raw data. Sure, I would be happy to look at the data too. Um, yeah, I, th I think that would make the statements a little stronger if we could, if we could be a little more um, specific about the, the numbers. Uh, here, so sure, yes, thank you. Sure, no problem. Uh, so that's the okay. uh, for this point here. Thanks. Perfect. All right. Anything else here, Dr. Thompson? 
I just wanted to recommend that when we finish section one before we start section two, that we take a brief 10 minute uh, break for our, for our participants. Perfect. Um, let me see. And I think we only have. All right. So let's go ahead and finish this part right here and then we can move along. Um, was there anything else on this um, about the studies that anybody had, uh, Dr. D'Amico? Yes, yeah, I have something above that also. Um, if, but if, yeah, so where it lists the, uh, the different percentages of states that prescribe at different levels, I'm wondering if it might not be worth having a sentence either before or after this that explains what legend is. And, you know, we could do it really in one or two sentences because not everyone reading this report will be familiar with these terms. Sure, absolutely. We will add that in there. Legend in the different categories. Yeah, that way they can yep. really have context for understanding what this is saying. And then down in where we were before, after the study, where you have the list of the responses for reasons for moving, uh -huh. I, I felt like when I read this, <clears throat> that number two, number three, and number the last one were all kind of saying the same thing. They're all, it's all different ways of phrasing the restricted scope of practice. So you said number two, number... This one here? Three. Uh -huh. uh huh. So basically, California's unwillingness to allow NDs to practice to full extent of training and education. Restricted scope of, scope of practice is basically the exact same thing. Right. And the last one, California is one of the most limited scope of practice, is the exact same thing. So we might want to just summarize those together in one point. Okay. Let's do that. And then this one here. This is Bruce. Let me just jump in and say, I agree. That's, I think that's a great idea. I think that it's, uh, you know, having done a lot of survey research uh, in my past uh, career, uh, I think it's, it's, it's completely legitimate to categorize the, the verbatim responses that you may have gotten. So this would be helpful. Perfect. My next comment is for page 28 when you're, when you get there. Okay. You said 28? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, 28 uh, goes to this next section. So if we don't have anything it's actually else, before um, section two. <laughs> okay. okay. It's just perfect. right. It's just Nansiak. Um, yes. Later on in the doc in the document, Nansiak is uh, listed like what it is, but not here. So we might want to just put in the full title since it's the first time we've introduced this acronym in the in the document. Okay. Thanks. That's it. Perfect. Okay. Um, did we want to go ahead and take a, a small break, uh, Dr. Thompson? Yes. Let's just make it 10 minutes um, so that we can still get through a lot of this before we need to. Um, to end the meeting, but uh, so if we could reconvene at 1043, please. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, are you on? I am. Can you all hear me? Yes, excellent. Um, can, do we need to do another roll call? Yes, we do. Great. All right. I will go ahead and take our roll call if everybody is back on. Dr. Dara Thompson? Present. Thank you. Dr. Greta D'Amico? 
Present. Thank you. Dr. Vera Singleton? Present. One second. Dr. Bruce Davidson? Present. Thank you. Dr. Mina Yoon? Present. And Ms. Shirley Worrell? Present. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It looks like we everybody's back on and we have quorum. Excellent. So this has been working well, going two pages at a time, asking for questions. So we're going to move on to section two, Rebecca. Perfect. I will go ahead and share my screen. All right, there we go. Everybody can see that okay? All right. So we left off here right before section two. Uh, we went ahead and added to, uh, I'm sorry, we went ahead and added that we needed to add what NANSIAC stands for. So we'll go ahead and do that here. And going on to section two, which is the performance measures and customer satisfaction survey. Um, so this, you know, it, it's unfortunate. We have not received any customer satisfaction surveys for our enforcement. And I don't know if that just means that we're doing what we're supposed to and nobody has any anything to say bad about us or what. I don't know, but this is, it, it, I mean, we had only a couple of responses last time and this time we have none. So um, it is what it is, but we went ahead and, and put that information in here um, and that's about it. Uh, let's see here. We will also make sure that at the end of this uh, report that we add all of the attachments, which is why these attachments are kind of left here so that I can go back and, and enumerate them correctly. All right. Going to section three. Um, oh, Rebecca? Page... Yes. Sorry, I just have a quick question. Um, no, for, for this section, is the con customer, is that um, the naturopathic doctors, or is this uh, consumers that are out in California? These are the consumers or whoever had placed the enforcement case with us. So okay. this is information that goes out to um, consumers or to licensees or whoever that make a complaint to our office. Got it. Thank you. No problem. All right. And Dr. Davidson. Thanks. Yes, that was the same question I was asking. Just in, I guess maybe it's a terminology thing because the question itself asks about customer satisfaction, and the response says consumer satisfaction. So in this instance, we're you're just we're just referring to to everybody who's a customer, really, uh, who are licensees as well as patients. Correct. Yes. Right. Got if it. if the licensee was the one that that um, submitted the complaint, that is correct. Complaints. Uh... So the so what the con, the customer satisfaction um, survey is only for enforcement. Um, so any time that a case comes in and we do a closure, that link is sent to them and they can take that um, survey. Um, it's it's not a mandatory thing. It's just put into their closures and um, provided to them. So this information here um, is basically for the complaints and I can add that here. However, the legislature knows exactly what the customer satisfaction survey is, but I can add a little bit of information as to the specific reason behind it, if you would like me to. Well, yeah, maybe I guess um, I'm noting here, there's this uh, reference to a vast number of consumers. So here again, it's a qualitative statement rather than a quantitative statement. So um, whether that could be supplemented with a, with a quantitative statement, I don't know, but uh, it's a judgmental uh, qualitative statement rather than a numerical quantitative statement. You know what I mean? Yes. Uh, and here again, I guess there's a, so, so I guess even from what you were just saying, it's not immediately clear to me whether what we're talking about here are licensees expressing their satisfaction with the enforcement uh, process that they were that they were part of, or uh, patients expressing their satisfaction with 
with regard to their role in that process is or or both i guess is the, is it both yeah no it does not go to the respondent it only goes to the complainant so it would only be a one-sided thing I, I mean i'm sure that if we sent it to the respondents i'm i'm pretty positive the type of response we would get from them but from the complainants it's it's just kind of wanting to see what their satisfaction level is um on how we um how we processed and and took care of their case okay the complainant being a, a i guess a patient right is that what you mean um, patient, consumer, yeah. another licensee that may have a complaint about a licensee or an unlicensed practitioner. Oh, Correct. I see. Okay. So, right. So, I guess the, the well, I don't know whether it needs to be in here because, like you were saying, maybe everybody already knows this except for me, but in this case, only complainants receive satisfaction surveys. That is correct. So, what I'll do is I'll just add a little... Um, uh, like a little, I don't know, um, information at the very beginning of this as to what a uh, customer satisfaction survey is, and then um, just kind of, yeah, I, I think that'll that'll be fine. Uh, yeah, that would have been helpful for me. Thanks. Yeah, thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. Okay, Dr. Thompson. Yeah, so for this section, it sounds like it was only responded to in the terms of how people are satisfied with our enforcement. But of course, the committee does other things um, such as, you know, licensing and processing licensure. So is there any measurement for those? We um, at this time, the Department of Consumer Affairs, to my knowledge, does not have one for licensees um, or or for consumers for any other reason except the enforcement. And I do believe that these came out during the CPEI, which was the Consumer Protection Initiative Enforcement or something to that effect. Um, but it was, there were a lot of issues with, um, with the, um, the consumers, the complaints um, back in the day. And so as, as a result, there was a survey that went out to upon the closure of every case, and that's what was started to be collecting. And I think somebody just hold on one second. I think there was a statement. Um, um, sorry, I don't know where it just popped up, but I believe that they're going to be rolling out another one. Let me just take a look here really quick. I think somebody just sent me a message. My apologies, this is the moderator, that was me who sent that. Yes, Solid and all of DCA are moving t away from the postcard surveys that only go out after a complaint is wrapped to a more general online survey system. So Perfect. I don't have any specifics, but it will be addressed in the future. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Right, right. So it seems like a, oh, sorry. Uh, Please finish. Oh, yeah. So it seems like as far as this um, review, those are the only surveys we have to go by. And so that's an appropriate response. That is correct. Yes. All right. I was just going to ask Rebecca if. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, I didn't want to interrupt you. I just wanted to ask if you can zoom in on your screen since you've got some extra space on your desktop, it will make it bigger for us. Perfect. Yes, thank Is that you. Easier? Oh, no problem. Okay. All right. So uh, we will. I will add a little bit of an introduction of what the um, CSS is here, and then um, it'll make it easier for maybe those that just don't know what it is um, to kind of get a little grasp of it before moving on. All right. Section three, fiscal and staff. So this um, portion here. Uh, it's basically all data driven. Um, the fund condition for the past four years, uh, just basically if we had any uh, issues, challenges, that type of thing. Um, did anybody have any questions um, about the fiscal and staff um, on page 28 and 29? And this here is going to be updated. I just needed to go back and fill in the stuff from here. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Nico. On number 13, it says the fee for an active or inactive license is $1,200, but later in the table, it says the fee is $1,000 and the statutory okay. limit is 1,200. The statutory limit is 1,200, I'm sorry. Thanks. Mm -hmm. No problem, thank you for catching that. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised, so let's go ahead and continue on. Uh, we have page 31 and 32, which are the budget change proposals, staffing issues, Uh, Dr. Davidson. Uh, thank you. Yes, in section 15, the staffing issues, I believe the word in the, th the near the end of the third line that's intended is inherent rather than adherent. Oh, it is. And I was speaking, doing speech to text, so it probably didn't catch uh, it. Let me look for that here. The end of the third line of the response, the third word from the end of the third line. Oh, here it is. Oh, did I not spell that right? There we go. Uh, Sorry. There okay, go. there we go. And then, um, no additional staffing increase since, oh, uh, yeah, in the draft that I was looking at, that seemed like a hanging end of a sentence, but in your, on your desktop there, it looks like no additional staffing increases, period. Good. Yeah, that's what I was looking yeah. for. Okay. All right. And Dr. D'Amico. That was actually the exact same thing I was going to point out. And my next item is in set in number 18. Perfect. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to, to 18 then. Um, 18, um, the beginning of the response says the volume of initial license applications varies from year to year with no apparent trend other than that should be included. The volume increases when best year students I believe there's a scope bill that may run um, to offer them the full scope in California. And I just wanted to know, so let's put that in, then that. Oh, no, instead of the? No, no. There's no other trend other than that the, uh, other than, I guess you can say volume increases, total volume increases. Um, I, but my question was, is it just past year students specifically? Well, because past year students are the only ones here in California that would normally would set up their practice here after they graduate. And that's normally what we see in places like Arizona and Washington, where a student goes to Bastyr, Washington, they graduate and then they set up practice in Washington. Normally that's are how you, it's done. Are you actually sure? Are you sure about that? I'm just wondering because, you know, of course I always was from California intended to come back. This wasn't open at the time, but I visited exactly. all the schools and chose the most sunniest place I could go, <laughs> but then ended back, back here. Um, so I'm not sure if maybe somebody says, oh, my aunt lives in Washington, so we'll be up there for a few years, and then we'll come back to California. Yeah, I mean, it It could go either way, but for from my understanding, the majority of the folks that went to Bastyr and graduated from San Diego um, and then decided that they wanted to leave afterwards. It wasn't necessarily because they wanted to go back home or that type of thing. It's because the, um, the practices in other states, the benefits of practice in other states were just greater. Um, and uh, with the survey that we just did back in September, um, another one of those was that the business practices in California were just too cumbersome for our um, our NDs, and so they went to states that had, um, you know, less taxes for businesses, and they were just uh, not as regulated as California. So there's there's more than just our um, scope that is that is causing, you know, NDs or 
potential NDs to leave the state, um, but that is one of them. Okay. So in the sentence though, should we change uh, students to graduates? Because students can't be applying for uh, initial licensure. Yes, that is a good suggestion. I went ahead and changed it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Davidson. Uh, uh, thanks. Also uh, in this um, section here, I guess it's uh, here again, it strikes me that what we're taught, we're, we're making a statement about uh, what it, other people believe. Um, and so I guess what we're really saying here is that we're observing an association. I'm not, I'm not saying that we should use these words, but my interpretation is we're observing an association between an increase in, in application volume from graduates of last year when there is a scope bill running. And so we infer that that's because they, they've noticed that and they like it. Um, but we're not reading their minds here uh, that we don't know, you know, we, so the, somehow or another, the word believe there just strikes me as a little odd. Um, sure. So let's see other than the, the other than that volume increases uh, occur are observed uh, from Bastier graduates uh, when there is a scope bill running that may offer them the benefit of full scope in California or something like that. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting too picky here, but if I want to, if I if I'm going to be reading it from with the eyes of a of someone who's going to be critical of us, then I wouldn't want to make any assumptions here. I guess. Sure. No, that's a, that is a good point. We will. Um... I'll reword this section here um, that we're observing a trend of increases when scope bills run, but we're not sure if that actually is translating to the reason for them staying. So um, I'll I'll tighten this section up a little bit and then um, get, provide it to you guys for review. Yeah, well, yeah, we may assume that on that on that basis, but that's the basis of of the assumption. I mean, which is a legitimate basis for sure, but. It, it's it's our belief that that's that that's the reason we're we haven't done a survey to ask them right right yep uh, so just to be clear there thank you I'm sorry sure. if that's too nitty gritty but that's the way my no mind that's that's fine it's it's that's perfectly fine uh, Dr Thompson thanks um, I agree with um, Bruce's interpretation there and I just want to say that. I also believe we should change Bastier to just naturopathic graduates um, to include all of the schools. I understand exactly what you're saying, that the majority of people do stay in the state that where they went to school, um, but I just don't think there's any reason to limit it to that because I think it probably applies to all of the schools. Sure. And I think the reason that I stayed with this context is mainly because during our last sunset bill, and right after um, the Bastyr San Diego um, campus opened up, there was a large um, increase in our uh, licensees that, you know, applicants that year. Um, and we noticed that. And so one of the one of the reasons that we made this assumption is because during the time um, it was a lot of people in California really wanted a school that was closer, of course, instead of having to go up to Washington um, or Oregon. And so uh, we, you know, at that time felt that it was the reason that we received such an increase in our applications was because Baxter was here and it really brought in a lot more of the people wanting to be in California. Um, however, after the unsuccessful um, SB 538, we lost a lot of those brand new graduates. Um, they kept it for two years and then they left. And um, that was very easily, you know, easily relatable. So um, I will definitely strengthen this part up though. I think we could absolutely put that as an example of what we're talking about. But like I said, I, in that more general sentence, I wouldn't uh, limit it.
And when you uh, work on rewriting this section, I think the other aspect is to not call it a scope bill, maybe just a legislative bill, because somebody might assume that a scope bill may mean something different. And it kind of des describes what the bill is. Um, Word scope is already in the sentence anyway. Exactly. Benefit of a full scope. Okay. Yeah. So instead, a legislative bill running that may offer them the benefit of full scope in California. Okay. Perfect. All right. Any other suggestions um, or concerns about this section? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and continue on to the next page, 33 and 34. And this is just going off of uh, how many licensees we have, the data. I'll be adding the um, cycle times from our performance measures here. All right. Okay, I don't see any uh, hands raised for 33 or 34, so we'll go ahead and move on to 35 and 36. And this is basically just continuing on with our uh, legal requirements of out-of-state, out-of-country applicants, uh, military licensure, waivers for military spouse, All right, so I don't see any questions or hands raised, so we'll move on, page 37 and It looks like there might be a, a little typo at the bottom of 36. Uh, the word time seems to have an accent on it, and it's um, underlined in Word. Or keep at this, is that true? Where, this one? Oh, yeah, it must just be, while well, it was speeding by, it looked like it had an accent on it. Oh, uh, yeah, no, they just want me to change it to currently, but that doesn't oh, Okay, right, so. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. All right, uh, so page 37 is just basically um, breaking down the parts of the NPLEX. Uh, page 38, um, going and talking about the um, first time pass rates for NPLEX and the information about the examination. Uh, were there any questions or concerns with this um, the NPLEX information or the school approvals? Okay. I, I think on 28A, there's just a quotation mark in front of the A that doesn't need to be there. Okay. I'll remove that and... And on number 30. Okay. Um, it says there's two Canadian naturopathic medical schools currently accredited by the CNME, Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine and Boucher, but above, earlier in the report, we said that these two colleges had been combined. Yes, they merged into one, but so, we should, so uh, CCNM, um, and it just recently had merged in with the Boucher, um, so Boucher took over the, um, naturopathic uh, graduate, um, or I'm sorry, the naturopathic degree uh, program from CCNM. Um, however, we still spoke about the two here. Are they two different schools or one school? They, two well, they were two different schools at the time. They are still two different schools, but the program merged into one, if that makes any sense. So are, is it two accreditations or one accreditation? So the CCNM still has the accreditation, but after this last, um, I believe after, ooh, after this, after the, after whatever their accreditation stops, they will, they will not, uh, no longer try for the accreditation because it goes over to the Boucher Institute now. Okay, so it's all right to have these be different in the two different locations. Yes, okay. yes. 
Rebecca, I'm sorry, I, I had you take out that quote, but I see where the end quote is. I didn't, um, for 28A, I see on C there's the end quote. So I didn't realize that that was part of that. Um, where's the end quote? Oh, it is. Yeah. yeah. So we can leave it because it was just, it was just quoting the section, but we don't really have to have it. So it's up to you. However, the stylized you guys, um, prefer, we can either put the quote back or we can remove this one. I'm fine removing it. I just thought it was okay. a hanging open quote. Nope, perfect. Sounds, sounds good. <laughs> All right, and so going back down, uh, continued education competency requirements uh, at the end of page 39 and 40. Are there any questions about this information here? Okay, I don't see any. Uh, we'll continue on. And so page 41 just talks about how the board can, or how the committee conducts our CE audit, uh, consequences for failing an audit, uh, how many audits we've conducted in the last uh, four fiscal years, uh, what the board CE approval policy is. Um, are there any questions or concerns with page 41 or 42? I see none. We'll go ahead and continue. All right, and now we're going to start section five, the enforcement program. And are there any questions or uh, Dr. D'Amico? Number 33. Uh-huh. Um, so I did submit some changes here that I don't see, and I have a question as well. So I okay. had, ref and maybe you chose not to for a reason, but I had suggested rephrasing this um, to unlicensed activity comprises the majority of the committee's enforcement work at 71% of all cases, just to kind oh, of shorten sure. up those first two sentences. Okay, I, I didn't see that, but I will I will look for that. So I will um, use okay. And then um, during 2020-21, there were staffing issues due to a leave of absence and challenges from the pandemic, which slowed the processing. So you'll see all of those. And the next okay. paragraph, my question is, uh, might we want to refer here? to the section of the report about the different titles, which we did do, I think in workforce development, um, mm -hmm. we might say C section, you know, X number, whatever, for more explanations on title or title protection. This is the first place in the document where we're introducing these terms and okay. it's not gonna make sense to a newcomer the first time they're not going to understand what we're referring to. Okay, we will do that. And then in the last paragraph on that page, uh, in order to protect the consumers, a committee would like title protection within the Naturopathic Doctors Act to further protect the safety of consumers in California. And I wrote when I was going through this, should we be more specific about which titles we want to protect, but we may just want to refer to that section again here. Um, to be clear about what our specific ask is. And because it's right here is the section you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thanks. Oops, I actually found a couple more. <laughs> okay. At the end of section 30, at number 34. <clears throat> uh, 34? Mm-hmm. Oh, going. that's 33, okay, 34. Okay. This is where we say, uh, even though 
activity remains a large portion of the community's enforcement caseload, making up to 71% of cases. We hope that continued educational informational outreach campaigns will assist in continuing to reduce the unlicensed activity. Um, we might want to say C section again, X on workforce development for further discussion of this issue, because even though that's a very sweet and hopeful sort of statement to make, um, we put in a sentence in there that says, you know, we're not sure how many people looking for healthcare are going to check the DCA's website before they look for a doctor. You know, it's like nice that we're doing this outreach, but it's not really reaching a lot of people, I don't think. Right. So I want to make sure that that links to that. <clears throat> and then, um, and I think we did explain, you did, yeah, my question was about the registry and that was explained later. So we'll handle that when we get there, but we might want to also refer to that, you know, if they have questions about what do they mean, refer to the section of the document where we are discussing sure. that further. Now about the registry, um, and we'll, we'll speak about it a little bit later in here, and it's just an alternative to title protection if we don't get it. I just don't see any other way of being able to properly track these unlicensable nature paths and continue enforcing them on the licensing fees of naturopathic doctors. I think it's very unfair to the licensees and to the consumer um, that we are continuing to have this problem and that those that can make a change are just unwilling to or for some reason not wanting to do it at this time. So um, I think that just having an, an alternative um, recommendation um, and at this point Point, you know, talking to a couple of other um, of other licensing or regulatory boards um, with DC leadership. Um, this was just one of the you know alternatives that were thrown out. So we don't have to keep it in here. I just wanted to provide it in here in the event that you guys wanted to kind of um, maybe look into it a little bit more. And we can discuss that further when we get to that section, right? Sure. Because I know we Absolutely. have I know we have a lot of feelings about this. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. And continuing on, Dr. Davidson, yes. Yeah, uh, so just a question about that sentence. Does the, the uh, says further with a title protection, does that a need to be there? Uh, it's a little awkward. Uh, with, sure, with we can take that out. Or an unlicensed natural path registry in place. Okay, yeah, so that was my question about that in terms of just the wording. But then did you just say that you have spoken with um, others in DCA about the concept of an unlicensed registry? Is that what I understood? Yes, yeah, so I actually brought it up in one of our meetings that I've had with um, DCA leadership. They thought it may be a good idea or at least a good alternative. Um, and then in speaking with the um, SNMRA, um, during one of our last meetings, um, I was just kind of putting fillers out to see how many other uh, regulatory boards have some type of a registrant or at least track their um, unlicensable population. Um, and there are a couple that are doing that. So um, not that they're actually registering and giving them a certification of any type. Basically, it's just they're, they register, they're saying, hey, I am a um, you know, practicing nature path, traditional nature path. I cannot be licensed as a naturopathic doctor. You know, here's my $50 registration fee. Here's where I work. Here's my practice information. And here's my educational background. Because in our statute, it actually states that people can use or individuals can use the term nature path traditional naturopath or uh, naturopathic practitioner if they have the education that allows them to call themselves that. So that's kind of where it gets sticky because we don't know the background of these people. We don't know if they took a six month online, you know, naturopathic herbal, you know, education uh, course or if they actually went to you know, Trinity or who knows, but it, we just don't know. And without being able to track them, we don't even know if they're using the term naturopath, um, 
legally. So it's it's just one of those things um, that we we've, we've kind of been tossing around. I see. That's helpful. Yeah, I guess you know, big picture. It seems like a, an interesting concept to me. I, I what I'm hearing you say is that there is evidence of this kind of a thing being in place in other states, and also mm -hmm. possibly I didn't, I'm not sure if you said this or not. There, there. This kind of a thing is something that's done in California by other boards or committees that are that are uh, regulating uh, licensure of healthcare practitioners. Is that true too? So, not so much in California. I would have to see what um, what other uh, programs in California. I, I'm not sure if there are some that have kind of a an in between. Um, registrant here in California, but I know that outside of California, um, other uh, naturopathic regulatory um, authorities uh, do do offer that a type of registrant. Uh, I see. Okay, yeah. So other states, and then I guess that I know we'll I guess we'll talk about this some more in a minute or two. But then it implies uh, maybe some kind of um, enforcement authority on our part. Um, or benefit to them, I guess, uh, in terms of getting them to do it. But anyway, maybe that's part of another discussion. Yeah. So it would it would benefit us in the terms of being able to track these these um, nature paths. Yes. Or individuals and um, and to have some um, some fees that we can then use to go and enforce them because right now we do have enforcement authority. Um, over anybody that is practicing within the scope and does not have the benefit of an ND license. Oh, we do. However, um, with that being said, we're using licensee funds to do that. Um, and it really does eat into our budget if, you know, we are going after and 71% of our enforcement cases are, you know, unlicensable people that have not put in to our budget. So this is just one way of kind of balancing and offsetting uh, what we what we spend in enforcement on unlicensable um, activity or unlicensed activity. I see. That's very helpful. Yeah, I totally agree that this is a benefit to us. And I guess what I'm hearing you say is that the uh, the legislation authorizes us to to engage in this kind of an a action. Um, with regard to the unlicensed naturopaths, so so we have the authority. To, to do this? So in, we have the authority to enforce um, our statute and that includes uh, for those that are unlicensed. Um, we don't have the authority to have a registration for them right now. It's not in our scope. It's not in our authority. Um, we don't have any authority over them in that aspect. Um, and again, you know, there are pros and cons to this. Um, it could it could be, you know, in terms of optics um, that, oh, that person is registered with the Naturopathic Medicine Committee. That must mean that, you know, they are this or, you know, A, B, or C. And when we're in reality, they're not. So um, it, it, could, it could have some, some opposition to this because of that reason. Um, and, and again, we would only be wanting to do this if we don't get the title protection that we are trying to get in order to protect the consumers. Um, and in that case, we would really need to um, put in a lot of work in order to differentiate the difference between the registrants and a licensee. So there are some, some you know, drawbacks from having a registrant like this, um, but you know, it's just one of the alternatives that that I have seen um, and that I thought maybe I could bring to your attention. Um, but if anybody has any other alternatives, I, I would be happy to add those as well. Why don't we put a pin in this and discuss it further when we get to the section where this is elaborated upon? And Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, and, and then we can be very clear about our ask in this document because we want to be very crystal clear about what we really need and want. Sure, absolutely. All so right. We want to make uh, a reference here to that section there. This is uh, since this is the first time it's brought up, I guess. Yes, and so I do have that up here, but I will also. Okay. Thanks. No problem.
Okay. Any other questions on page 47 or page 48? All right. So we will go ahead and go down to page 49 and 50. Any questions or concerns with these two pages? Um, I think th this is Dr. D'Amico. As of a couple pages ago, my edits are not uh, have not been incorporated. My um, or, or many of them are missed. So I can tell you what they are if you want to catch them now. Or was do you this on the? Them? No, that's fine. Um, Dr. D'Amico, was that on the first? edit that you sent last night or yes. was it from Yes, this, this is from okay. last night. That's weird. I must have missed it. Okay. Um, interesting. Um, okay. So let's, go ahead and go can to we section. look at 37 just before A? Um, uh -huh. Record keeping should have a, a hyphen between record and keeping. First, uh huh. And in that same sentence, ethics courses should have an S. Okay, and then in 39, even though I know that you're still working on this paragraph, um, the second to the last sentence, this type of violation significantly increases the risk of harm to the consumers in California and takes potential patients away. Uh, so take out the comma. Uh-huh and and then take away it also takes away potential pa no and takes potential patients away so take yeah from licensed naturopathic nds additionally this confusion may cause loss of income for california nds i'm sorry so additionally um, in the sentence below, additionally, uh -huh. this confusion may cause loss of income. Mm -hmm. Just to get me potential. Yeah. And good. Night in number 40. Okay. Um, after the fines. If the citation involves let's see, a violation that has immediate relationship to the health and safety of another person, comma. I just changed sure. the semicolon to a comma after the word person. Uh, in the two, first two lines, two lines below 2,500 on the in the middle. Right here. Um, to the right. Up oh, right there. The cited. Oh, right here. Yeah. Okay, and what did you want here? Just make it a comma. Okay. And the last uh, sentence of this number, 40, mm -hmm. I just put a note that this says four and then it has the numeral four. Maybe this is something that'll be done later, but in some places we're using the numeral and some places we're using the spelled out number. And in this place we're using both. Okay. So that's just uh, a consistency thing. Maybe that'll get caught later. Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll put it in here to make them consistent. Okay. And then on number 41, using um, adver in advertising violations, are you ready? Okay, I'm sorry, in advertising violations? Uh huh. Using models, and then I just changed it to without indicating whether the image is of an actual patient or not. Okay, I'm going to put here. See Gretel's, yeah. Okay, perfect. And in the last paragraph of 41, I was confused. Um, fine amounts are based on the severity and number of violations a licensee or licensed individual has against them. For instance, an unlicensed individual who has multiple complaints of using the ND title after complying could be
be subject to a larger than the one for someone's first offense. To a larger fine, not amount, you don't have to put amount, than one for someone's first offense. Okay. Um, but I was confused about the meaning. Does that mean someone who's been fined, they complied, and then they stopped complying, so they had to get fined yep. again? Yep. Okay. They do it all the time. They will take it down off of their um, their website until we go and check it and see if it's off. And then we'll, about a year later, we'll get a complaint that they're using the ND title. We go back to the website and ta-da, it's there again. So yeah, no, they do it all the time. Um, okay. And for people like that, they would be, of course, uh, find a greater amount than just a regular little 500 or 1,000. It would probably be the whole 5,000 at that point. Okay, and can you take out the comma after larger fine? Thanks, Dr. Okay. Thompson has mm -hmm. something. All right, and Dr. Thompson. Well, I also just question the need for against them in that uh, first sentence of that section. If we just say the number of violations a licensee or unlicensed individual has, do we need against them there? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, what was that? Do we need against them in that sentence or we can we just end the sentence as the number of violations the licensee or unlicensed individual has. Yes, that would be fine. Okay. Are there any other changes to this section? I have one in 46. Okay. Okay, in the middle, um, prohib uh, probation and a cost repayment, the A should be removed. Um, and just before that, once a licensee is placed on, let me just look, you take away a probation. Uh, and in the next sentence, those who whose order allows for a payment plan will have one set up with the probation monitor. I'm sorry, so uh, can you say that those, again? Those whose order allows for a payment plan will have one set up with the probation monitor. There you go. Okay, and in 47, the question, which is not you, Uncollectible is spelled I-B-L-E at the end. <laughs> Up here? Yeah. Actually, we're, we're having a delay on your screen, but I'm sure that you're seeing it. Right, you know, number 47, the question, just before it says explain. Unlicensable is with an A, uncollectible is with an I, I learned. Oh. Gotcha. Yeah, it's not giving me a line under either one, but I'll change it. I, you know, and I've seen a couple of others and I did not change them. And the only reason is because it came from the legislature. I don't want to, <laughs> but I, I do, I do appreciate it. Okay. Uh, we try to leave the place better than how we found it, right? We do our best. Yeah, of course. Okay. Um, um, anything else here? Number 50. Okay. Uh, in the middle, I can't see yours yet. There's a delay, but in the middle paragraph, um, in the past committees with respondents provide a refund or fee waiver to some complainants, comma, when appropriate to provide when appropriate, comma, if it can assist in making the consumer feel whole. So two commas, some complainants, comma, when appropriate, comma, yeah. Okay. An example, a bit, Rebecca, because we're not able to see the section you're you're looking at right now. We're in 48. Is the bottom one? Um, Here we go. There we go. We can see it now. 
Okay. Oh, scroll up, scroll up a little bit more so we can see it. No, go the other way, down. There. And then I'd like to say an example of this approach in the third paragraph is when. And in the next sentence, the enforcement unit was able to contact the licensee. Just take out uh -huh. the and. Uh, not that one, the one before. Yep. Was able to contact the licensee. Was able to contact the licensee. Uh -huh. And assisted the consumer in receiving records without being charged. Although this was not required by licensee, the committee acted on behalf of the consumer to attempt to find a resolution. Good. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Apparently, I need to slow down on my speech to text. All right. <laughs> Let's... The computer is still not as fast as you, and that's a big compliment. It really isn't. OK, so let's see here. All right, were there any other um, changes by any of the other members? Uh-oh, why am I losing my screen? Hold on one second, sorry. I'm sorry, it's showing that it's not responding. So I'm not sure if it's my meeting or if, can you guys still see everything? We do. Okay, perfect. It, it just came back up. So I don't know what that was all about, but I apologize. Okay. So were there any other changes in the section by any of the other members? Okay, I don't see any. We'll go ahead and continue to move along. So for section six, public information policies. This Were is there Dr. any Nico. changes? Yeah, uh -huh. on number 51. Um, first, a question. The, this is the last sentence of the first paragraph. The community uses its website, subscription list, licensee, applicant, email service, and Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube accounts to deliver timely, accurate, and relevant information to stakeholders. Do we really? I mean, I, last yeah. I checked, we, we, we haven't even YouTube. <laughs> so we... all of our all of our webcasts are put onto the YouTube channel. Yes. Oh, wow. It's okay, not cool. Our YouTube channel, but it's the department's YouTube channel where all of our stuff is posted. So um, we do have that. Um, we do have a Twitter account. We do have a Facebook account. Both of them are being used. Um, we don't have a whole lot of subscribers to them yet, but we are posting to it. Um, and Dr. Singleton has some wonderful things um, ready to go for it. So yeah, those are, are just starting to be ramped up because we've, we've just put them into place. So, um, but yeah, they are, they are all part of, of how we are con communicating with our- Just because licenses. you deliver something doesn't mean someone was home to receive it, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we try. <Okay. laughs> in in the third paragraph, uh, current and past meeting, can you take the comma out after online? And once posted, are available online indefinitely. Okay. In 52, second, uh, second sentence, uh, when DCA staff is not available to webcast, a committee staff will make an audio recording of Do you see that? 52? Yep, I got it. I got it. Okay. It's just delayed on our side. We're not seeing it yet. Okay, perfect. Okay, I got that one. Yeah. Go ahead. And number 53, due to committee meetings only being held on an as-needed basis. Okay. And 56... you highlighted already. It's just saying that we might want to repeat or mention the social media accounts here because that we kind of answered that question in another section. Right.
Okay. And I have a small All thing right. at 57. If there's nobody uh, has any other comments on section six. Any other comments on section six? Nope, we don't see any. All right, so section seven, online practice issues. Yeah, 57, second paragraph. I think it would be helpful um, in the second sentence. This issue arises out of the confusion caused by the current law. Put California Business and Professions Code section 3645 in parentheses. Okay, that's it for that section for me. Perfect. Anybody else have any uh, suggestions or comments about section seven? Okay, I don't see any. We will continue on to section eight, workforce development and job creation. 58. Uh, third, second sentence, additionally, the committee expedites license applications of all naturopathic doctors who are a spouse, a spouse or domestic partner. Okay. And then the last sentence, I wanted to just ask, this looks like an ask of the committee, and I don't know if this is a place to put it because it's kind of buried in the middle of a number instead of at the end. So we want to discuss sponsoring a bill that would allow NDs to practice as trained. Like, is this the place where this goes? So this is just kind of speaking to it, but there's more places that we are asking about this. Yeah, we can ask it um, multiple times. I think we do, yeah. Yeah, okay. But I will, make sure. I, I will make sure, let me just put this in here. I'm pretty sure we do. Okay. And then I added, I just added at the bottom of the next paragraph, there are currently nine medical schools in California that train MDs and DOs because I believe they're about to start a new one in Merced. You see uh, the UC there? I'm sorry, then, where, you said in this, this paragraph here, uh, number two. The very, the very end in the parentheses, I just added currently nine medical schools because I think oh, there's okay. about uh -huh. the 10th. So there are currently nine medical schools. Okay. Perfect. My next Thanks. one is at the end of 59. All right. During the pandemic, Fourth sentence down, or fourth line. Uh, okay. Several weeks before the correction and the recommendations were made, comma, some licensees, so take out delayed. Uh, okay. Some licensees delayed renewing their licenses. So I took out some stuff. Re renewing. Their licenses. Okay. Then take out timely and this. Add a comma at the end of licenses. Okay. And make it resulted resulting in some loss of the committee's income from, and then just take out licensure, just put renewals because we've already got licensure in there. Perfect. Okay. All right. Before we move along, does anybody else have any suggestions or comments or concerns about the sections we just went through? Okay, perfect. All right. Rebecca, we've reached the end of where I was able to get to with careful examination. So perfect. this is the point at which I'd need to do more work to see if there's other things to pick out. Perfect. I appreciate you, Dr. D'Amico. You are always wonderful when it comes to proofing our documents. So thank you so much.
All right. Um, are there any other sections in here that that anybody, any of our members have been able to view or review already? Dr. Davidson. Hi. Uh, so let's see. Um, section 61, there may be a couple of typos that you may or may not have already addressed. Let's see. Uh, the fifth paragraph, the third line, let's see, where is that? Um, one, two, three, four, five. The third line, is it on or by? By the committee on by 2007. Uh, they by the committee. On by. There's oh, I think it should have been, let me see. Uh, procedures pending a study by the committee in 2007. Wait. Provides for. Uh, so maybe just make make a note to rework and clarify that sentence. Yeah, those, yeah let me. I'm yeah, those two right words here. next to each other don't quite work on by. Naturopathic Doctors Act provides for minor office procedures pending a study by the committee, which was completed in 2007. I just took out the on and by. And the first, so and the first 2007 either, right? So it just, so by right. the committee, which was completed in 2007. Okay, that's right. great. Yeah. And then there's another one kind of like that. On okay, hold on one moment. My computer just froze up again. I'm so sorry about this. I think we need to put money in the budget for some new equipment for you. Oh, you know, it's, I don't know what it is. I think it's Teams. I, hold on one second. I'm going to quit Teams on my computer. It's such a resource hog. I apologize. It's still not responding. <laughs> Okay, I um, don't know why it's doing this. Uh, moderator, can you take back presentation really quick so that I can figure Certainly. out what's going on here? Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I'm just doing a quick save because I didn't want it to crash and us lose all of that. So, okay, perfect. I am going to go ahead and reshare. Okay. Let's try this again. Okay. All right. I think we're back in action now. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. Dr. Davidson. Uh, no problem. Thank you. Uh, so then that same response, the, um, the very end of that response, uh, the last two lines, the last sentence, uh, okay. this situation contributes to some of the loss of licensees in the state who leave to practice with a scope that equates to practice that matches education and training. So. I think you have to just take out that equates to practice. This situation. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm I don't know where you are. Are you on the same um, same paragraph? The sa no. I'm at the end of that response. In the next paragraph, uh, which in the draft that I'm looking at breaks over two pages, but I'm not sure if it does. It starts with currently there are not many opportunities. Yeah, so the very last sentence, okay. the very last sentence says, this situation contributes to some of the loss of licensees in the state who leave to practice with a scope that equates to practice that matches. There's too many practices, two practices. Yes, there is. I think it should read, leave to practice in a state with a scope that matches their education and training. Yes. 
that matches yeah, their that. education. That yeah. just take out equates to practice. Uh-huh. Yes. And that matches their their education and training. Yes, yes, that's it. There it is. Yeah, that was that. There you go. Right, good. Uh, good, yeah, so that's it for me there. And then I had one more thing I wanted to ask about. Um, um, section farther along. Uh, section 11, actually. Did you want to jump that far ahead or did you not? No, we can definitely go up to 11. I'll go right back to where we were. Okay, go ahead. So, section 11 in, let's see, where am I looking at here? Sorry. 60. Oh, no, uh, it's before section 11. It's in section, it's in item, it's in the section that says uh, restrictions on naturopathic doctors related to ordering and administration of COVID-19 vaccines. Okay. Uh, in D, what was the reason for the outcome of each request? It says, please see answer to question number 70 above. So yes. question number 70 is below. Oh, was this 68? Sorry. I, my numbers got messed up. So it's 68. So okay. basically the way that we presented the information, it broke down exactly what reasons for the outcome for each request were, why we were asking for it and what right. it did. So, right, so it's question number 68 above. Yeah. Great, okay. Yeah, thank that, you. That was the little Perfect. There thing. Okay, a uh, small uh, typo type thing. So um, that's my big contribution right now. Thanks, that's it. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, we'll go right back up to where we were. In, in 61, just as a note, this is where we more fully describe the limitations on minor surgery. Yes. So that's what you'll be referring right to from the front of the, the beginning of the document. Yeah, so I will put this. Okay. All right. And were there any questions or concerns with this um, information in 61 and 62? All right. Okay, so section nine, current issues. Uh, any changes here? Rebecca? Yes. Dr. Thompson, it's my understanding from what several of the members have said that most people um, weren't able to carefully review beyond this point. Um, mm -hmm. Can the members let me know if that is not true for any of them? Nope, it looks it's, like it's probably yeah. the case. Yeah, and so given that, I think we have two options. The first is to just try and review in more detail um, these sections while we're in the meeting. Um, the second option would be to wrap up the meeting in the next, you know, five, 10 minutes if after we go through any questions or concerns that people have. Have you send out an updated report with all of the edits we've talked about? Mm -hmm. um, and then each member, as they go through, as they find more edits or concerns, could communicate those directly to you. Um, and then we could continue to update the document prior to the December 2nd meeting, um, where we would Perfect. hopefully have gotten through most of our edits and be able to have a, a more, you know, a more efficient meeting uh, for final approval. Um, sure. So. I'm I'm really open to either of those as long as you know we stay within our our time limitations for today's meeting. But I wonder what other people's preferences. I'm noticing that we only have really a few pages left, so there's a chance. I don't know. We've got till twelve twenty-five. 
we might be well, able to do it. I would say we, we could probably take another 10 minutes to go through the next six pages just, just to go over them while we're all here. And then we'll wrap it up um, and I'll make those changes um, that we uh, discussed in today's meeting. Send this information back out to you guys um, and then um, feel free to send in any edits or concerns at that point and then we'll, we'll tighten everything up at that point. I think we also need to make sure that we have enough time to talk about uh, the naturopathic uh, or naturopath registry. Yes. So if you, if you guys want to discuss that um, for the next couple of minutes uh, or go through this, um, it's definitely up to you. And I'll say that uh, this is Dr. D'Amico. Uh, Dr. Yoon and I did go do Section 8. So we have been over it with a fine tooth comb. Um, yes, so have. we could probably skip that unless Rebecca changed anything significantly. Nope. No, there weren't many changes to it at all, I don't think. Why don't, maybe we should discuss the registry because that might change some of the writing for the next version. Sure. It also makes more sense to discuss the registry since that's something we have to discuss as a committee. Right, absolutely. So, um, um, Rebecca, you've, you've touched on this already in this meeting, what the, what the point of this registry is and some of our concerns around it, but is there a, a section in here that specifically refers to it in more detail? You don't think so. I think really what, what I brought up, let me see, let me, let me do a find and see um, how many times we've brought the registry up. Okay. <clears throat> so let me see. Okay, so under title issues is where we bring it up. Um, and this is right here at the new issues section 12, which is the very end of this report. Um, and basically, uh, the committee believes that the title of nature path uh, should be protected under the Naturopathic Doctors Act in order to fully protect the consumers from unknowingly seeking out an licensed individual. Um, it is hoped that the associations that represent many unlicensed naturopaths can be approached so that a new title such as holistic health practitioner can be devised, allowing the licensed NDs to use all titles containing the word naturopath and naturopathic. This would greatly clarify the issue of public, um, oh, for the public. So we kind of go on and this was, for example, a doctor of osteopathic medicine can be called an osteopath, the, you know, chiropractor is for a doctor of chiropractic medicine and doctor of dental surgery as a dentist. So um, I think here we're just kind of stating the obvious, at least to us, is that, you know, the term naturopath and naturopathic doctor are used so commonly interchangeably that it's, it is an issue. Um, here we have uh, that if no title protections will be added to our statute, the committee would be open to the possibility of creating a registry. So this right here is what we're wanting to talk about. Um, and again, this was just an alternative suggestion um, that I put in here, but you guys can either take it out or decide that maybe a registration happened, not maybe not with us, but a registration to where we can track these people better. Um, I don't know, or maybe that they need to pay into a an enforcement, um, I don't know, fund, I don't know, but th there's got to be something that we can do in order to offset the cost that we are paying to, you know, enforce the laws um, for unlicensed activity. Can I say a few words about this? This is Dr. D'Amico. Absolutely. Okay, first, before I forget, can you change um, a sentence in here? The committee could provide administrative services to, pro to properly track these unlicensed practitioners instead of naturopath. Uh, actually, it was further down, but you can do it there. Uh, okay. I don't, again, like, do we really wanna use that word? So third up yeah, from the bottom. And 
practitioners is also one of the words that is very confusing to the layperson. When you have a naturopathic practitioner and a naturopathic doctor, people think they're one and the same. So, yeah. and, but I get it that practitioner can practice anything. So, we'll we'll continue to use it. But it was one of yeah, the so, issues. So we might well, yeah, and we might want to say between you know before this paragraph, we might want to say further. The word practitioner causes confusion, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure they have this in that there are people doing tooth whitening that aren't dentists and stuff. That's kind of, there's other situations like this. But um, I wanted to back up for a moment. And uh, can you take out, before the word you're on right now, just put unlicensed instead of naturopathic. Uh, Properly I'm track sorry. these. So third line up from the bottom of that current paragraph. Okay, this one here. No, down, down. To, yeah, to the no, no. no. Um, so the second to the last sentence of this paragraph, along with minimal registration fee, the committee could provide administrative services to properly track these unlicensed. Uh -huh. There you go. Oh. And you could take out naturopathic. Okay, but I wanted to just back up on the on the subject here. Now, I think Mina and I uh, worked on this to some extent. So this was partly something that we discussed when we were working on this section. And we got this idea partly from a presentation from a town hall that Rebecca had at the CNDA, where she presented a white paper that was produced by the, I think it's called the World Federation of Naturopathic something or other. Yeah. Is that right? Uh huh. <laughs> is that the correct title? And yeah, it um, is. it's they, the World it, World Naturopathic Organization or something like that. Yeah. And they actually have a title. They have a a table in there that shows their suggestions or actually what they have found to be the basic uh, educational requirement for people practicing at different levels. Like this is doctoral level, this is certificate level and so forth. And right. um, Rebecca could share that with us or I could um, share the website with you in a moment so you can take a look at it yourself. But I like the idea of a I mean, if we're going to go for a standard, we might as well go global if it's already been suggested and discussed at forums internationally, including Americans. And what I like about it is that if we all agreed on a title that would say you have to have at least anatomy and physiology, you have to have studied this and this and this and this, and we all agree to it, that's actually good for us and it's good for them. And we're not going to get title protection it's it's unlikely we'll get what we want without the people who are lay naturopaths actually having a title that they can put forward and feel good about. We need to give them an option, not just take away all their options, if that makes sense. So right. the reason that we that... suggested in here. No, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The reason we suggested in here. Um, holistic health practitioner is because that was the solution adopted by San Diego County many, many years ago, maybe over 20 years ago for this particular issue. And we could actually adopt that statewide and say, okay, he's an HHP, holistic health practitioner. People understand that that means they have some basic level of education. Before I went to naturopathic medical school, I looked at all of the programs and I was enrolled in Westbrook University. Oh, yes, I was. And, um, <laughs> and I decided that that education was very costly, difficult to achieve, and wasn't going to actually give me what I needed at the end, which was a license. So I changed. But I have a real familiarity with what used to be Clayton with Trinity and a lot of the other places where people get certificates or what they consider to be medical degrees, frankly. That's, that's what it says on their, on their paper. Um, and it's confusing for them, the students, because they don't realize that doesn't mean that they can't actually practice. Maybe they do now, but that's how it was 25 years ago. So 
Um, so that's why, a, 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 I don't know about the word registry, like I don't know about that word, but actually giving them a title, they could become a, this is just a, one idea, they could become a regulated category of work supervised by the naturopathic medicine committee um, that would ensure that they had certain educational minimums before they could call themselves a lay naturopath because the variety of educational level because some of the programs that i looked at you're reading a few books and then they give you your certificate the variety it really is quite varied some do more some do less none of them do hands-on training at all so um I think bringing them in and welcoming them and say, okay, let's make it a, a standard would be great. But this is a big, it's a big path to follow, but at least it's a positive path versus just like, don't do that, don't do that, you don't do that and not giving them any options. Right. And I mean, we could, and those are some really great points. And I'm, and I'm gonna say that if we brought this request, not, not the registry, but just the request of title protection back to, the legislators, they're going to say or, or ask, what other alternatives have we looked at? What, you know, um, are there any other um, ways that we can make this happen? So just just showing that we are, um, you know, up to looking at um, other alternatives for this is something that they're really going to want to see. Um, it, it may be beneficial for us to, to have this information. Um, we may want to start having some communication um, with the association um, for the unlicensable nature paths here in California. Um, I believe it's called the California Naturopathic Association. There's also so, the AMMA, um, which is the American Naturopathic Medical Association. Yeah, there's that one as well. Um, and you know, I, we've, I've had a discussion with the president of the California Association already, um, and, you know, they are also looking at ways to, um, to make this problem go away. You know, they, their uh, members, um, who are the people that are getting in trouble from us for using the naturopathic doctor title, you know, when I was having the discussion, the first thing they said is, well, why can't you guys just use naturopathic medical doctor and let us use naturopathic doctor? And I mean, they were really serious about that. And <laughs> I said, no, we're not gonna go for that. Um, I can tell you that right now. Um, but it, it was just one of those conversations that I think we need to kind of start somewhere. So um, Dr. Yoon, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, so I think that this is going to be a big problem if we use the word registration. Um, in both Massachusetts and Minnesota, they have a registration for naturopathic doctors. Um, so I think that that term registration across, you know, the U.S. is, is going to be difficult if we're not really going to be able to say across the board, yes, somebody who's licensed versus registered um, you know, from one state to the next. If somebody from California or somebody from Minnesota moves over to California, they're not gonna know the difference. Um, I also think that because there, I don't believe there are any other states who are licensed have, um, they do have title protection for the term naturopath. So I don't know if any other states um, have left that out, um, but I do believe California is the only one. Um, and anybody could correct me if I'm wrong on that. It, yeah, it's not the only state um, that has this title issue. Um, and the FNMRA um, actually just conducted a survey. So I um, will be privy to that information as soon as the survey has been conducted. Um, about title issues in other states. So I will have more information as soon as that survey has been um, completed. Okay, for, you know, even this past uh, week, I've had three patients who's called me, who have called me a naturopath. 
Right. And Absolutely. so this, I mean, this is, you know, I think a, a really huge issue. I feel that if we do a registration, the issue can be that there will be much more confusion to the consumers. There's going to be, you know, not clarified what uh, education is going to be for a lay naturopath versus a naturopathic doctor. Um, I think that it's going to cause a lot more uh, um, difficulty. I understand that you're looking for solutions. Um, are there, but I feel like if we do implement it, it'll also be hard to undo it, uh, which is would be also an issue if we do end up with um, a huge, you know, registration system. And now we've given them the title of naturopath and uh, there's more complaints, more issues of people practicing medicine without a license. Um, which maybe is good for us because then we'd have more more money in our uh, budget, but I don't think that would solve uh, the headaches that are happening at this point right now. Um, the fines are they? Are, is there a place where they're dictated right now? Like the you were talking about the five hundred, the thousand, or five thousand? Is that uh, written in some DCA code, or is that determined yeah. by? So we're actually still working on our disciplinary guidelines um, and we have not um, put that in effect yet. Um, I can tell you that we have a $5,000 statutory limit um, within regulation, I guess regulation, regulatory limit um, for citations um, and it can't go over the $5,000 mark. Um, but we don't have anything listing exactly how and in what order that we um, cite and, and issue those amounts right now. Okay. Because one of the things that I was thinking about was, you know, a solution we can propose is increasing fines or fees so that people don't, aren't, um, repeat uh, issues and we would also have uh, more money in our budget because of the fines, but. Right. Yeah. That is, I mean, we, we could, um, instead of doing a $1,000 fine for the first offense, you put it up to $3,000 and it may make them, you know, more hesitant on using a title that, you know, they shouldn't be using. Although they, I'm, I'm gonna tell you in their minds, they should be able to use it. That's what they think. They, the, the common comment that I get from them is, I have a, a degree that says I am a naturopathic doctor. So, I mean, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a very difficult situation that the legislature has put our committee in um, mm -hmm. when in terms of having our title and having a title that's so close to it that the consumers are just totally, you know, confused about it. So um, we can, you know, I, I see that we're starting to get really close on time here and we have to go out for public comment really quick before we um, close this. So I think um, we can go ahead and take out the registration portion of this and put that we
work with those states to also um, kind of put a kibosh on it, but I, I just don't think it's going to happen. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. I, I, that's helpful to learn about. Thank you. No problem. Dr. Thompson. Thanks. Um, and I just, I, I pretty much share all the same concerns that Dr. Yoon shared. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I just had a quick clarifying question uh, regarding our fines. Uh, are we having issue with collecting those fines? So we have them in place and we can raise them, but how often when you fine a practitioner, do they actually pay it? So the, the the citations that we've issued in the last four years, we have been able to collect on those fines or on those citations. Um, for the majority of the pre-cites, which we we call an educational letter, um, what we do is we'll send it out. If we notice that there's a violation, we don't just say, hey, you are violating. We say, hey, you may be violating. Here's what you're not allowed to do. Here's what you're allowed to do or what you must do as an unlicensed practitioner, um, you know, providing healing arts. Um, you have 30 days to comply with this and not use the naturopathic title. And at that point, like I said, the majority of them will comply. They will take down the naturopathic doctor title. They'll start putting the disclaimers like they're supposed to, and they're fine. But we do have some repeat offenders that we have noticed that they've taken it down at one point, and when our analyst goes to check it the next time, it's right back up there. So um, there are some that they, they know the law, and they're just going to do what they want anyway. The other ones, they just don't know what they don't know. So when we bring it to their attention, they stop doing it. Um, but there's always a new, you know, traditional nature path every day. So <laughs> um, hopefully we'll get a handle on this. And I, you know, I totally get the, the reason. And I, I did say that there would be some pushback on, on a possible registry because there may be some, I mean, there, you know, there's pros and cons to everything, and there there is a pro to this, but there's also the cons of which would be the late people may be a little bit more confused because now both of them are under us. So I totally get that. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll tighten this section up. Um, we'll take out the registry information, and then I'll get this um, edited, sent back out to you guys by the end of this week. Um, and then uh, we'll we'll go from there because I I know we're kind of getting really down to the time limit now. So I will stop sharing this for now. Yes. So I think that um, at this point we do need to take the time to ask for public comment. Moderator. Thank you. This is the moderator at the direction of the chair. I've opened the Q&A feature of WebEx and we're sharing instructions on the screen. If you'd like to make a public comment on the Sunset Report as we've gone through it so far, please click on the question mark icon, typically in the lower right corner of your WebEx screen. Or if you're on a mobile device, you can click the three dot other options icon to find the Q&A button and type the word comment into that text box and hit send. I'll give people just a moment to locate that field. And I see no request for public comment from our one attendee. So uh, shall I close the feature? Yes, please do. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have our next meeting date already scheduled. So we do not need to um, do that. Does anyone have any future agenda items that they want to bring up at this time? Uh, Just Dr. Demetra? Yeah. Is there a chance that if we all go over this next draft and we're happy with it, or we only have minor changes that aren't substantive that we would even need to have another meeting? Or is it pretty sure we do have to do that no matter what? I think at this point, and um, Sabina can, can jump in if she'd like, um, but I think at this point there's too many changes. They're, they're, they're not just little edits here and there. There's, there's quite substantial changes that I think we need to come back for you guys to approve this. 
I would agree. Sabina, do you have anything different to say about that? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. Yes, I was going to uh, suggest if there are any of the sections that don't have substantive changes, maybe like the budget and the other fiscal uh, more uh, data driven sections, you could take a motion today to approve those and delegate those non substantive technical changes to Rebecca. And that way you wouldn't have to come back and review and have a motion for those sections at the next meeting, but it's entirely up to you. Yeah, so if you guys are okay with approving up to maybe section through section 10 and then do the um, the issues and the um, section 12, which is, oh, let me see here, uh, the new issues and the prior issues, um, we could do that. I think there were enough places where we were still waiting on data or this or that, it would be hard to pick out what's absolutely finished in such a short time right now. But if we check them off when we go through the, the next draft, we can quickly say, did anybody have any issues with section five? And we'll just approve it very quickly when we get okay, there. Perfect. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. I, I, so I would agree with that. So um, in that case, uh, does anyone have any other future agenda items? Okay, so hearing no other agenda items, I think our plan moving forward is that Rebecca, you're gonna get us this document with the edits. Do you think you could get that to us by the weekend so that we have time to review it at that time? Absolutely, I'll have it to you by Friday. Wonderful. Um, we're all going to try and read through it with fine tooth comb and let Rebecca know any edits that we have ahead of the next meeting so that hopefully we can be very efficient um, in getting the final text approved. Uh, any last questions from anyone before we adjourn the meeting? We can get, do a brief pause and see if anyone has anything to say. All right, I'm not hearing any comments, um, not seeing any hands. So at this point, I would like to adjourn the November 17th, 2021 meeting of the Naturopathic Medical Committee. It is 12.23 p.m. Wonderful, thank you so much. And for all the contributors, thank you very much for your assistance with this report. Thank you. Thanks. I think the committee should send out chocolate to everyone who's working.